They were moving north. So we're driving along what's called the Talak River. You may see a strip of green over there. That's the Talak River. And I'm hoping they haven't crossed it. If they have, the good news is, is that it's not flowing too strongly for us to cross. Sometimes it is the case. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are happy to have Tristan back behind the wheel. Not sure how long he's been gone for. I've lost track of time, but he's certainly been away, enjoying some time off. And I'm sure you're also just happy to be driving around the Sabi Sands as well. So it's not only the Mari you get to traverse, but also the wonderful Sabi Sands, which complements this area so well. They're very different ecosystems. And I think the two complement each other incredibly well. Just the fact that Tristan's already got a leopard for you guys to see is testament to that. There are not as many leopards here, or maybe there are, but they're not as easy to find and possibly not as habituated. Now, for those of you who may be joining for the first time, we would love to know who you are, how you found us, and what you think of the safari so far, or what you might want to see on the safari. So please let us know. It's very easy. You can just use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. And please do send through your questions, comments, and thoughts. Otherwise, it's awfully lonely out here. Marvelous. I can't believe how green this grass is. They've obviously got some good rain here in the week or so that we've been gone. And I'm told a lot of you are very, very excited that we have been spending time with Cheetah again yesterday and today, as well as the prospects of spending more time with them. And as am I, they are incredibly beautiful creatures and have provided us with so much excitement over the last couple of months. They're an animal that we sadly haven't been able to share many sightings with you guys during our time down south in the Sabi Sands. There's not many cheetah there. So they often like to sleep in this little valley under some gardenia thickets and I'm already seeing some vehicles. So we're learning some interesting behavior about these cheetah. Had I not spent time with the cheetah in the past, I would not have found them this morning. And it's great that their behavior is beginning to become a little bit predictable. As I'm sure this is where they are here. Mr. P, yes, of course I would stop for a leopard if we saw one, even though my focus and goal is to get some cheetah for all of us to spend time with, I would not forego any other interesting animal or sighting if Mother Nature presented it to us, and I could think of nothing better than showing you guys a leopard. I've yet to show you one here in the Maasai Mara, and I've only seen one myself in the two months of being here. He was a beautiful, beautiful big male. Where are the cheetah? Okay, we'll just snipe you a view from here. Just snoozing under the bushes over there. And I'm guessing that they could well be snoozing for quite some time. You can see their bellies are full, filled with some tasty wildebeest that they snacked on this morning. It was an incredible, incredible chase and hunt, the most exciting that I have been lucky enough to share with you. We had to race after them and stop the vehicle on two occasions once we had caught up, kind of caught up, to the action. And Manu did a great job on camera because the hunt absolutely ambushed us. We were certainly not ready for the action when it unfolded. Oh, Linda, thank you very much for your kind words regarding my hard work. I am fortunate in that 
my work is something that is very, very cool and that is that makes it very easy to do. So the more time I can spend out in the field with you guys, the happier I am. Gives me an excuse not to check my emails. Well, not really, actually, because we've got Wi-Fi on the vehicle, so that's it's not a good enough excuse. But as long as we're busy on Safari, I guess I can't be checking my mails. And I am loving every moment of it. to Andy, you'd like to know if there is a vehicle limitation per sightings here in the Mara, and uh, not really, but depending on the nature of the sighting, the rangers and researchers are the two people that kind of monitor and police the amounts of vehicles that come into sightings, but there can be a lot of vehicles in sightings here, there's no two ways about it, but thankfully, I mean, it kind of everyone kind of self-polices one another, occasionally you get somebody who does uh, the wrong things, but, you know, in general, it does work surprisingly well considering how many vehicles can be in a sighting. People generally are quite caring and thoughtful of the animals. So there is no limit here like Juma. Um, so it's quite a different experience regarding that and the vehicles. It's more of a free-for-all. Hello, Will. You are wondering whether it's not dangerous to go out in a completely open vehicle like this. And no, it, it, it's really not. And if we were to wind back the clocks a couple of thousand years and drive a vehicle into a wild wilderness like this, all the animals would flee from it. We are a large, noisy being once we are in the vehicle and quite intimidating. So all wild animals in all wild parks have slowly over many, many years become accustomed to vehicles and us as humans. So they don't see us as a food source, they don't see us as a threat, they merely see us as spectators, which is the best position we could possibly be in with regards to wild animals the less we get involved and the more we leave them to do their business the same they'll do for us so we're not really at risk certainly on foot it becomes a different story but out here at the moment we are safer than you would be in just about any city so Good news, sorry, I think I misread the comms earlier. I thought Tristan had already found you a leopard, but he obviously hasn't, or he's left it because he's found you another spotted creature. And, well, maybe it's two spotted creatures. I guess you guys would love to go and find out exactly what is going on down there with them. Welcome back, Tristan, and enjoy the two spotted animals in one sighting. Thanks, Scotty Dyson, and you enjoy your spotted animals. I don't know who's more jealous of who. I think Scotty with the leopards and me, with, well, jealous of his cheetahs. But yes, you can see we have another spotted creature, and it's not Hosanna at this stage. We went driving around just to see if we can't find Hosanna and follow up on those Franklins that were alarm cloning close to Tandy, and we bumped into a hyena. I'm not sure which hyena it is yet. It's kind of been sleeping very flat, and actually that's the first time it's put up its head. So for all our hyena experts out there, hashtag Safari Live or in the YouTube chat as to who this may be. I don't know if it's going to be easy to idea it from just the head shot like that. But there's the rest of the body and you can see that hyena has definitely had something to eat. So there is a nice full belly. I wonder if it maybe hasn't stolen the other carcass. Because remember there was a carcass from Hosanna and there was one from Tundi. So I don't know if maybe this hyena has managed to grab one of those two or the bits of it and has had a really good meal this morning and is doing much like what Tandy is doing and that is having an absolute fat nap in the shade. It still kind of pushes its head up every now and then just to see what's going on but other than that it is very very dormant. I would imagine Hosanna must be here somewhere because I've done a loop all the way around and I'm yet to find his tracks coming out of this area. It seems as though the only tracks that we found were where Tandy dragged the kill to the car to the tree itself. So I'm sure Hosanna is here as well. We'll just have to try to see if we can find him. But what a way to come back to work to have two leopards and a hyena in the same proximity and the chance of the Inkuma Pride bumping into all of this a little bit later would be quite fantastic too. So I reckon we're in for a goodie this afternoon. I keep looking back just to see because the hyena keeps picking its head up and looking over its shoulder. So I was just wondering if Hosanna maybe was somewhere on one of these trees. So Moira, you want to know, is a hyena match for a leopard? Well, most certainly a, a big adult female hyena will take on female leopards 
without a shadow of a doubt and they'll also even take on young males inexperienced young males like Hosanna or Tamba would be dominated by big adult fully grown hyenas they are big they're bulky and they've got serious power in their jaws so leopards know that it's rather than fighting over a small bit of meat they'll often just leave it and try and get up into a tree and get out of the way of the hyenas I've seen a couple male leopards stand their ground in their time so I've once had a sighting of Anderson and it was amazing because Anderson is probably one of the biggest male leopards that I've seen out in this area and he was sleeping much like this hyena was sleeping and was busy taking it very easy and he was kind of watching and in the distance some of these hyenas started to arrive and there was a couple females in there and there was one female in particular and she's from the Elephant Plains clan which is just to our west and she's a big ginger hyena and she's massive and she's got this kind of distended belly from all the young ones that she's had where it's herniated and she's really a big girl but she has no time for any other cats she's always quite aggressive and Anderson was kind of watching and thinking to himself well nothing's gonna happen and he just kind of flopped back down and from the top of this hill it was about 100 120 meters this hyena just started running and Anderson kind of popped his head back up and was watching her come and she kept coming kept coming and eventually Anderson realized well, this is not going to work for him and he tried to kind of turn but at that time the hyena hit him and knocked him off the bank and he went rolling down and ran up into a tree so even a big male leopard like that can sometimes fall foul to hyenas but generally the male leopards and hyenas will kind of just stand their ground with one another and leave each other alone but this particular female hyena was having none of it when it came to Anderson right I think Seb let's just quickly check if we can't see any sign of Hosanna Noel you wondering if the leopards put prey up trees to keep it away from other animals well that's exactly why they're doing it so they're putting their prey up a tree to get it away from the likes of these hyenas hyenas are not able to climb like the leopards are of course lions in a tree like this would most certainly be able to get up there and, and take that kill away so if the Nkuma pride came across this carcass and saw it from a distance they would go up into the tree and grab it and they would feed on it themselves because lions everyone thinks lions can't climb they actually can climb and they do climb quite well it's just that they are not very graceful coming down so leopards do it mainly to get it out of the way of things like hyenas and jackals um, and a little bit to a degree of lions if they can get it into a tree that's densely foliated and hidden from lions then you'll find that they will try and put them up there for that reason but mostly it's to get rid of oh did you see that Seb that's amazing and there's Hosanna there was a slender mongoose that was feeding off the carcass and it did a suicidal dive out of the tree and Hosanna went chasing after it that's ridiculous <laughs> I've never in my life so there we go that just shows you that mongoose will actually scavenge off a carcass in a tree that is crazy well hello Asana <laughs> that was absolute madness the slender mongoose was so scared of us that it literally jumped from where that carcass is now out the tree and down and ran across this sort of gap that you see here and Hosanna came bounding off after it when he saw it falling out of the tree that's ridiculous and look at that full belly have you been eating nicely my boy <laughs> he's looking so good big and healthy and full bellied and a little uncomfortable I would say with all that food so there we go two spotted cats and a spotted hyena as well and a slender mongoose it's proving to be quite the predator filled afternoon already that's just crazy that is honestly the first time I have ever seen a mongoose in a tree and then fall out of the tree trying to get away from us that's absolutely insane how did that mongoose get up there? That's madness. You can see it's quite a long way up, so that mongoose has had to have run all the way up there and that way without being spotted by any of these cats. That is ridiculous. How is that possible? <laughs> Amazing. See something new all the time. It just goes to show that we as much as we see a lot and we spend a lot of time out here around any corner at any time can be something that you just completely have never seen before that is absolutely astounding now poor Sana is going to the toilet so we'll just give him a little bit of privacy we're not going to zoom in while he has his toilet time although it looks like he's now going to found himself a spot to lie down don't smell your own dung there we go are you going to come lie by us now he's going to sit now and he's going to watch his carcass very carefully so he's going to make sure no other slender mongoose goes up there he's also watching a few birds oh look there's the other carcass you see it Seb 
both carcasses are here. So, sorry, my hand got in the way there, but there's the other carcass high up in the tree. So, Tandi and Hosanna have got their carcasses in both in the same tree. Now, that's one for the books. So, there's the Steenbok up at the top that Tandi killed this morning. Because I asked Tux and he said they actually saw it happening this morning on drive. So, that's the Steenbok. You can see it's not eaten at all. It's completely whole. And then the Impala, the young Impala, is the one that the slender mongoose was busy feeding off, which is that carcass a little bit further down. So, there we go. That one. <laughs> So, and that's the Impala carcass, which is about a two-day-old carcass. So apparently, this was found yesterday morning, which is pretty insane. So, that is a turn up for the books. I would have thought they would have tried to put their kills in different trees and not to utilize the same tree, but maybe they didn't see one another and they kind of just put it up and that's how it is. But it seems like Taylor has raced through the Masai Mara and she's going to complete a predator-filled afternoon with the tawny-colored cats. We have managed to find the lions that we were searching for. We actually um, were able to locate them earlier this morning, just after the drive had ended. These are the. This is what I think is two of the sausage tree pride lionesses, fast asleep with their heads tucked in the long grass. Um, Interesting though, I'm I'm trying to remember how many cubs they had because from all my notes that I've got from what various people have said, that there were five cubs. Now, I'm trying to remember, maybe you can all help me out here. The sighting we had of them eating the zebra a couple of mornings ago. Does anyone remember or maybe have a full f portrait of all the lions and can count the cubs? Because we've only got four cubs here and I thought I remembered seeing five as well. So I'm a little bit on the on the confused side here. But anyways, uh, the two lionesses, they don't look particularly thin. It's hard to tell though, because they, well, there's a carpet of lions at the moment scattered around in the grass. Uh, they don't look very fat, so I don't know when they last ate, maybe a couple of days, maybe two days ago or so. There's plenty of game around though. There's buffalo, there is, there is also, zebra and all sorts of things. Now, Angelique, you said the sausage tree pride? Yes, yeah, this is most certainly the two lionesses from the sausage tree pride. What we are trying to work out, though, is exactly how many cubs we saw the other morning, because I thought we saw five. I really did. I thought we had, maybe it was four. I've completely forgot. I wasn't paying attention, to be honest. I only just started at properly making notes now, once I could go and do a bit of research myself. But they're fairly flat for now. They don't look like they're going to get up and do too much. But I, I think there's exciting prospects for a later tonight. Hopefully they'll go across. And, uh, and catch one of those buffalo. The zebras seem to have moved off and closer towards the escarpment because they were actually surrounded by animals this morning, but they were sitting in the lugger. And maybe as the day warmed up slightly, it wasn't particularly hot, they just decided to come and lay out in the grass. Now, Kimberly, you've said, yay, lions. No surprise there, we're in the Mara, the land of lions, which is very exciting. But we'll see, if we'll sit here for maybe about 45 minutes or so. If they don't get up to too much, we'll probably go and find something else. Maybe we'll quickly pop past the jackal den and come back this side. But they're fast asleep, absolutely fast asleep. Ah, oh, Leo, you said look at the beautiful background. It is nice. You may even be able to see that there's a bit of a storm brewing. You can especially see it in the far western corner of the escarpment. Um, it's not great, but but uh, Jar seems to think, and he, he knows this area very well, uh, he says that he thinks we might be lucky and that the storm is just sort of brewing on the escarpment and hopefully it doesn't come down onto the plains. But I'm watching these clouds creep over closer and closer, but the worst stuff is actually ahead of us. But it's okay for now. You can hear the thunder just rumbling in the distance. Now, I'm going to panic when I hear the thunder after the storm we got stuck in yesterday. It was hysterical, uh, getting completely drenched in literally seconds. It was amazing. I, I can't believe how big those raindrops were. Uh, one, one hit me on my head, as I forgot to tell you this. I was quite sore. I was a little bit upset by the rain that it could hurt me. Never did I think that rain could really hurt that badly. But, uh, you know, it does, nothing happened. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the rain doesn't play games games here. 
But there they are, just absolutely fast asleep, not really doing too much at all. Listening to the crickets, perhaps. There's the big clouds I was telling you about. Big cumulonimbus clouds forming in the sky. That's a massive one. But luckily, it's far away from us, and the wind is blowing it in a southwesterly direction. So it's not going to come back and around towards us. Thank goodness for that. I don't know if I heard correctly. <laughs> that sounded terrible, Alice. Please, please, can you repeat that again? I'm not, because I'm too scared to repeat what I heard. Snazzy. No, no, I heard something very bad there. Snazzy, I'm wondering where my sock buddy is. I didn't hear that the first time around. I'm talking, you're talking about, you can't call Maurice a sock buddy. I don't even know he's a stuffed toy. He's fantastic. Maurice, how do you feel about the elephants? Not the elephants, we're looking at lions. You're an elephant. I don't know what he really thinks about anything. He doesn't say much. He's quite quiet. Perhaps he'll come out of his shell in the next few weeks. We have only really uh, just uh, met. Anyways, we're going to go back across to Tristan now. How can I tease him? Let me think. I'm going to actually think about something to tease Tristan about. <laughs> but let's go across to the man who knows how to clean bathrooms really well. <laughs> Oh, Taylor McCurdy. Are we going to start this now? So the banter never ends with Taylor and Byron. It's quite funny. Yesterday I was with Byron. We had lunch together and it was a, quite an entertaining lunch, wasn't it, Seb? Yes. Seb also joined us as well. And we missed Taylor and we sent Taylor a few voice notes and the banter just never stops between them all. So we'll just have to think of things that we can talk about with Taylor. I will tell you one thing though, Taylor, as per normal, Byron has left our cars dirty, which will definitely make Taylor smile because she knows that every time when she comes back from leave the cars are normally clean i make sure that i wash them for her and she does the same for me but with byron he likes to leave them dusty for us so it's quite funny that she always t gives byron a hard time but you can see hosana is still very sleepy at the moment he's really not too interested in what's going on i would imagine that both of these leopards are going to come to this area around sunset both of them should start moving up towards this tree and start getting into feeding mode hosana is so full I would imagine that he's going to kind of not take any chances in feeding in this heat. He'll rather go up when it gets cooler. The interesting thing is going to be to see if Tandi gets a chance because Tandi's dragged that kill all the way and put it up in this tree. Now, she can't get to that carcass without having to first come towards Hosanna. And the in interaction between those two is going to be absolutely fascinating because while she can be very aggressive towards Shongile, as we've seen in, in the past, and she's chased Shongile away with Hosanna, it's the same size leopard. Hosanna is probably actually a bit bigger and bulkier than what Tandi is already and he's not going to back down for food and it's going to be interesting to see whether her older more experienced kind of or her level of experience comes through and is able then to keep Hosanna away from this carcass or if Hosanna is just going to keep Tandi away and Tandi is going to end up sitting like she would if it was a dominant male if there was Tingana was here Tandi would have no chance at getting anywhere near this particular carcass so it's going to be interesting to see who actually gets to feed off what it's Definitely the Steenbok has not been fed on at all, so there's still a lot of meat in that Steenbok. You can see Hassan is kind of looking at the Steenbok that's much fresher meat. I would imagine when he does go up, that's where he's going to go and eat. The problem is where that carcass is, is not very friendly at all in terms of our cameras. Seb, you're going to have a tough time up in there. It's right up against the light, so hopefully if he does feed off that, he'll bring it down into a better spot. But isn't this wonderful? What a way to come back to work. It doesn't get any better than this. Mr. P, you're commenting on just how heavy he's breathing. Well, Mr. P, his rate of breathing is very heavy, and it's exactly like Tandi. You're going to see both of them breathing heavily, and it's because of the warm weather that we're having. Remember, it's been a fast change from the cooler, colder temperatures. Before I went on leave, I was wearing a jersey in the afternoons, whereas now there's not even a chance that we could wear that. So that, coupled with the fact that he's in distended stomach and he's full he's pushing up in his lungs it's causing a shorter breath to be taken as well as him being hot he's trying to pant and just cool himself down so he's going to be very heavy breathing but it's interesting to see just how much he's kind of growing every time i see hosana he seems to be just adding on a few sort of extra kilos and while he might not be massive in terms of his height yet or even his head size he's definitely starting to bulk up and his shoulders are getting bigger he's starting to get a lot more muscular around the legs and shoulder area so it's really interesting just to see 
his development and I'm so glad that he's making kills around Juma. It means that we should see a lot more of him over the next little bit. I wonder if Tingana has been seen much. Do you see much while I was away, Seb? Not much. A couple of times. Well, it was a couple of times more than what we saw him the, when I was here last cycle. I didn't see Tingana at all, really, in the last three week cycle that I did. So be interesting to see how Tingana starts to take Hosanna. The more he bulks up and the bigger he gets, and the more he has carcasses like this, the more likely Tingana is to start pushing him and chasing him into other areas. But hopefully Hosanna will be clever enough to just sneak around and keep these places for himself and just kind of be like Mvula in a way and move around as Tingana moves, move into a section where he isn't and utilize that area to try and stay clear. I'm surprised though because if he's had this carcass for two days, if Tingana comes past, which he often does in this area, and um, will probably then chase Hosanna away. So I wonder if we're now with this other kill being here, if maybe Tingana might arrive at some point. Imagine if we get a third leopard this afternoon, that would just be ridiculous. But not uncommon, as we know. Now James, you wonder if Hosanna stole the kill from Tandi, and that's why the carcass is in the same tree. Well James, was, I saw where the carcass was, so the carcass was dragged from where Tandi, where we saw her earlier, and then it was dragged along the road, and the tracks that were dragging it was for Tandi, so it wasn't for Hosanna, dragging it straight towards this tree. So what might have happened is she might have wanted to come towards this tree and then maybe Hosanna saw her and has grabbed it and taken it up. It's possible. The other thing is there's really not too many other nice trees in this particular area to hang a carcass. So she might have hung it next to me. There's another tree, but it's really kind of adjacent to the one that we see here. But maybe Hosanna grabbed it at some point and took it up into this area. Um, it's possible. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. The thing is though, I would have expected Tandi to give a lot more of a fight to her, to keep her carcass than to just let Hosanna take it from her. But interesting either way, and like I say, as the sun starts to set and the evening starts to kind of close in, it's going to be very, very interesting to and intriguing to watch these two leopards and how they actually approach one another. Normally with big male leopards, like I say, Tandi wouldn't really worry. She might come closer and look and chuff a little bit and try and kind of work her way into the tree without the male getting too upset. But with Hosanna, if she's brave enough and, and, and strong enough and, and hisses and growls and charges at him, you might find that because of his inexperience, he might might run and that will allow her to get up and feed but most certainly if you look at the size of his belly and you look at hers she's had not very much at all to be able to feed on it's been pretty much him eating everything so far so it's going to be very interesting to see whether or not she just abandons this or she decides to try and fight him off of the carcass now we've had far too many fighting of leopards lately so hopefully that doesn't happen So Mr. P, you were wondering, um, he was 13 months when he was left alone by Karula, uh, or well, unfortunately was basically orphaned by Karula, and, and is this normal time for leopards to be left on their own? Uh, Mr. P, no. So, well, no is not really the right answer. It, it's possible. So most of the time, leopards will generally stay with their, their mothers for a little bit longer than that, normally up towards two years. So they say generally between 14 months and two years. So I suppose it's not too far away. But given that she was, you know, still looking after them so much, I think that process was still going to take quite a while. So I would have imagined that it would have been closer towards the two-year side than the one-year side that happened to him. There has been leopards that have left their cubs at 10 months and, and have those cubs have survived. But generally, the, the mothers will keep them for a while. And, and, and particularly males like Osana, they tend to latch onto their mothers for a lot longer than the females. You'll often find male... Um, offspring staying with the females for longer periods I, I saw when I was at Sinkita we had Ravens caught female and at one point she had um, a, a male called Shinzele and then she had two younger males and the two younger males were already a year old and Shinzele who was now almost three and a half was still actually with his mother and she was looking after both the older male and the two younger ones which is completely unusual and not something you would hear of and the four of them used to walk around together it was really quite strange to see but the males tend to try and latch onto mom for longer it's easier remember that they they as soon as they go off on their own they then deem to be a threat by other males and are pushed around and have to be nomadic so if they can stay with mom as much as possible and be fed and grow and get bigger it's only going to mean better things for them as they become older and try and then start moving up 
in the world and to get a territory of their own so it was probably a bit early for Hosanna but as you can see he's doing just fine he's really kind of figuring it out he's he's managing to pull down quite large antelope in the form of these impalas that you see here and his condition is fantastic and you know we're, we're six months down the line now and he is in no way looked as though he struggled from day one so he just goes to show that leopards are, are very resourceful creatures and they will survive off anything if they have to we know that he used to hunt monitor lizards and terrapins as it started and he's graduated now into these antelopes and now that he's kill killing antelopes like this you're going to find a situation that he's really should be well set to carry on with life and and should be able to find his way his his biggest challenge now obviously is to find a territory and and to not only find a territory but to be able to dominate it and keep others at bay and that's going to be you know very difficult considering the density of male leopards within this northern section he's been aided somewhat by the current sort of bad luck that we've had with the sabi sands leopards of late where there's been a number of males to the south of him that have succumbed for various reasons and that's almost opened up an opportunity for Hosanna in a way. We know that his older brother in the form of Konuma has moved into some of those areas where male leopards have been killed by lions or have, are no longer alive and he's forged a territory of his own. So I wonder if Hosanna is going to follow a similar pattern and shift in that southward direction towards those areas. It's going to be interesting to see. I think Tingana is still fit and healthy enough that Hosanna doubt is going to get this particular section just yet but you never know Hosanna I mean Tsingana is getting older as is Mbula and both of those males theoretically are, are around the 12 year mark and that's quite old for a male leopard and so you'll find that they'll reach you know 12 13 14 and maybe disappear so it might actually be perfect timing for Hosanna to actually move into this area and take over now we're going to sit with Hosanna but let's while we do that, go across to Scott in the Mara, who's gazing upon not an impala, but a little Thompson's gazelle. Is this not an absolutely beautiful scene with all these little white flowers that have only emerged in the last week or so, along with the Thompson's gazelle, as always, wagging their little tails? The very dark backdrop and that bark, bark backdrop, that dark backdrop is a little bit of a concern. I've also heard some thunder rumbling off to the north and we may have another afternoon deluge. And after last night's antics, I'm not sure if I'm ready to, ready to get soaking wet again. It was a fairly cold and long drive home, but certainly worth it. Beautiful. So, you obviously realize we've moved away from the cheetah. We've just taken a short drive in the hope that we could find you some beautiful, beautiful scenes like this while the cheetah are sleeping, but we will be heading back there shortly just to make sure we don't miss out on any action. Martin, great to have you with us. You would like to know how do we get the picture from our vehicle straight to you guys live? And that is an incredibly good question for which I do not have the appropriate know-how, expertise, or knowledge as to how exactly it works. But I think it basically goes straight from the vehicle up to a satellite. And then I think from a satellite, it goes to some funky machine in London. And then from London, I think, it gets shot out to all around the planet. Um, I think that is how it works. There's a whole bunch of fancy machines called encoders and modulators and a few that I don't even know the names of that are fairly intricately wired together in order to get this worked out. Our tech wizard and camp Jared is having a little bit of a giggle in the final control room, I, th I think, as to my explanation as to how it works. Um, but what I can tell you, Martin, is that our team of tech guys are serious pioneers within this industry. They are ahead of the game and often have to build their parts and kind of interconnect strange things that aren't supposed to be connected in theory. So. It certainly is a lot of fun watching from a distance as they tweak and jiggle cables to make the feed and picture work. Even building the camera rigs is something that the cameramen and the tech guys also do on sites. We've got a over and under double decker 
camera combo with a infrared camera on the bottom and a thermal camera on the top. Sadly that thermal camera is taking a few days off. Roshni, I am very happy that you are enjoying this beautiful, beautiful view. Isn't it just something else? The vistas along with the animals that are dotted through them in the Masai Mara certainly make for some wonderful, wonderful views. A very calm and peaceful scene here. Hello, Cherie, you'd like to know if the animals ever get heat stroke. Um, look, I, I don't know if heat stroke is what would actually be the main concern for animals in very hot areas, but certainly I think it will have an effect on them. They may kind of dry out and dehydrate at a foster rate, but here in the Mara, it's not very hot. Throughout the year, the temperature is fairly constant because we are on the equator. You don't find huge differences in temperature between the seasons. And like I say, the Mara is typically quite cool. There are other wilderness areas throughout Africa where you do get very, very hot environments where some of the animals are adapted specifically to live in them and or have learned the ways of the wild to be able to survive there. Anka, you would like to know what these white flowers are, and unfortunately I do not have the faintest idea, but let me reverse a bit and try and get Manu an opportunity to film one, and maybe you guys can try and work it out. I don't have a flower book with me. Manu, go down onto this white one right here and see if you can get a good angle on it. That should work nicely. So this is what they look like up close. Very pretty. But I wouldn't even hazard a guess as to what it could be. Hello Eric the Poet. And you've mentioned that these flowers have just bloomed since yesterday's rains, and I'm sure a lot of them possibly did just pop out today, but I did notice a few yesterday, so I'm guessing before the rain, so I'm guessing it's a recent bloom that's happened within the last week. It was about a week since I was last here, and it certainly does make for a wonderful scene. I was in South Africa a couple of weeks ago and was very fortunate to be able to head up to the West Coast National Park where there's an incredible wildflower wild blooming every August and September and I was absolutely shocked at the amount of flowers in this place. It was ridiculous. So I'm quite happy to see some here as well. Not quite as many as the West Coast National Park, but certainly creating a magic scene. Okay, I'm feeling a little bit nervous that the cheetahs may be getting up and getting ready to move, so I think we should start heading back there. And I also want to be waiting there in case the rain does start to fall. We'll be in position where we can just drop down all of our flaps and prepare for the onslaught. Wonderful stuff. Well, as we make our way back to the cheetah, you are going to be making your way back to the spotted cat with Tristan down in Juma. Well, we are still with our spotted cat, and hopefully Scott will have some luck with his cheetah and see more epic sightings of them because well I think Scott has been spoiled more than anybody he's had some amazing stuff I've seen some crazy videos of his of those cheetah chasing varying animals around it's just the most ridiculous thing to watch those five cheetahs on the move so I'm sure Scott will get treated and if there's a storm rolling in hopefully that will inspire them to do a bit of hunting now Hosanna is still panting away and I believe that Scott was discussing do cats ever overheat and get heat stroke. Well, it is very, very possible for a cat to get heat stroke. It's highly uncommon in the wild cats because they are able to deal with it. As long as they can find shade and they can find water, um, they are generally fine. Um, it's 
The problem with them is if they get caught out in an area with no shade and no access to water, then heat stroke can set in very, very quickly with the cat. It's something that is quite dangerous for cats and you'll find that when they're panting, it means that they are very warm. Now the panting is much the same as what we were discussing earlier. It helps to cool the body down and how it basically works is that the saliva on the tongue and in the mouth as air is pushed over it and that rapid breathing is happening. So there's evaporation, that evaporation causes cooling and therefore the blood inside the, the mouth and, and that area cools down and then goes back into the body and that's a very basic kind of way of looking at it but that's how they they do it and that's why they pant a lot particularly in the summer months it's let's see it looks like he's going to go up the tree hopefully he's going to do it so this might be perfect timing for us let's have a look he's walking towards the tree a little sniffing a bit of dust in the air at the moment in fact there's been a lot of dust in the air no we're going to go to the loo first now you can see he's just in front of the car at the moment and it's a bit of a difficult area that we're in. We're in a, a place where there's a steep slope and it goes up onto the other side so it's not a place that is easy to kind of negotiate and so hopefully if he does go up what we might do is just quickly sneak around onto the other side once he's up in the tree because the light from the other side will be absolutely beautiful. It'll be that late afternoon light and Hassan has a nice gold color to him so if there's a bit of nice light on him it will be fantastic. But he looks like he's going towards the tree. He's certainly gazing with big eyes. Are you going to lie down there, right next to the car? Yes, you are. Okay, well, I'm going to have to just go back a little bit because otherwise we can't see any of him. You can see the front of the car over there. So we'll just try and... So yours is behind me here and he's just saying that he'll move a little bit for me. But if I go back to there, Seb, is that worse or better? There we go, so that's okay, we don't have to stress too much. But yours is being very nice and moving a little bit for us so that we can see him better, which is very kind of him. And you can see every now and then he stares over towards where Tandy is and has a little look. Leo, you're wondering how often big cats will drink water. Well, Leo, big cats drink water regularly, so you'll find, in, especially in a situation when it's hot like this, that they'll probably go down to water at least twice, maybe probably even three times in a day to gain the water that they need. They'll need about three to five liters a day, so they're going to drink quite regularly. In cooler temperatures, obviously less of amount of water is needed. Also, you'll find when they have carcasses, particularly fresh carcasses, and, and lions do this a lot more than what the leopards would but the lions will actually drink a lot of the blood and gain moisture from the blood of the victim that they've or the prey that they've caught so they will get moisture from that but after they've eaten the process of them digesting and breaking down all of that tissue as well as the the heat and the, the breathing rate that quickens means that they do get quite thirsty after a kill and you'll find as soon as they've had something they then tend to head to water and go get something to drink. Look how he's sniffing around. I wonder if maybe the scent of Tundi is not in this area as well. Oh, is it just too hot, my boy? Are you trying to find somewhere where it's nice and cool? Mike, you're wondering when a leopard <clears throat> is looking for a territory, which direction does he know? to head into. Um, Mike, well basically there'll be lots of natural factors that he'll will lead him to into territory. So firstly, he's going to hear the dominant males of this area calling. So he's going to hear Tingana making a noise, Anderson making a noise, Quarantine, Kunuma, all of those guys making a lot of vocalizing at night. So he's going to know there's a territorial leopard if there's vocalizing. There'll also be chemical signatures through scent marking. So Tingana, when he does his scent marking patrols, is marking his territory. Hassan will come across that. He'll sniff it. And through organs in the roof of his mouth, in those little pits called the Jacobson organ, he'll analyze that chemical scent and he'll be able to know, okay, that's a dominant male in this area. And so he'll keep moving through these kind of dominant male areas until he finds a place where there's very little marking, little, very little audio, and there is still food and water. Um, and, and safe areas to, to inhabit and that's when he'll start to set up his territory or if he's lucky he's going to come into a place where there's maybe a male that's 
that died for some reason, maybe lions have got hold of it or something like that, and there's a gap and he can then wedge himself in there, or he's going to have to fight for it and that means he's going to go after another male and he's going to have to have a competition and try and oust that male from that area. And basically that's what happened with the Mvula, Tingana and Anderson. So when I first started at Chitwa, Mvula was the dominant male around Chitwa here on Juma. Um, he came in a little bit, but there was a male called Jordan that was around here. And so Mvula was just south of Jordan and to the east, so into Torchwood and Coral, those areas and a bit into Mala Mala. Then Jordan disappeared and Mvula started shifting a lot further north. Then Anderson started to appear and that pushed Tingana from Elephant Plains to Mambili side, pushed him further east and that then pushed Mvula north into Buffel's Hook and then Anderson took over where Tingana was. So there's an ever-changing flow in it and, and as they get bigger and stronger so they'll be more confrontational to other male leopards around them and try and expand their territory as much as possible. But it's all to do with chemical and, and audio in terms of which direction they're heading to be able to find a territory. It also depends if they get chased. If Hosanna gets chased by Tingana, you might find a situation where he's going to end up going into another area and he's going to try and move south if he gets chased south or north if he gets chased north. It just depends on how that male that's in the area pushes him and moves him and makes him kind of go into different places. Right, now the beautiful Hosanna is looking around, scanning the skies and hoping not to see any signs of vultures. That's why he would have put his carcass in the tree. And so, talking about vultures, I believe our friend James Henry is also out with a bird of prey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all the viewers. I'm not allowed to say good afternoon everybody anymore because then Craig, who is on camera today, will tease me mercilessly. My name is James Henry, and it's wonderful to have you with us on the vehicle. I know we've had a very late start today. It's just because we've been searching for things here on the Masai Mara National Reserve side of the Mara River, and the first thing of great interest we have found is Africa's largest eagle. That, of course, is the Marshall Eagle. And behind the Marshall Eagle, sitting in a glorious tree, is a yet another dry season storm that seems to be thundering up overhead. Isn't he a magnificent fellow? Not common, but they are around from time to time. He's eyeing a herd of wildebeest. I think it's very unlikely that even despite his 2.8 meter wingspan, 2.7 meter wingspan on a very big one, uh, I think it's still unlikely that he's going to take himself a fully grown wildebeest. Uh, even a small wildebeest would be much too much for him. He's more into lizard. He is a great fan of rock monitors. See how he turned his head immediately as I said, rock monitors. Yes, I haven't seen any, I'm sorry. Now we're as live as all the rest, so please do talk to us using the hashtags for live or questions. No, not questions, no. Hashtags for live or the chat, chat section of the YouTube broad, broadcast. Yes, Kestrel Fox, you say, ooh, that's not a vulture, that's a very pretty eagle. They are pretty, but I think they're quite intimidating looking too. I think they've got a, a very sort of a mean and serious face. Not mean, very serious and sort of uh, intimidating looking face, I suppose. They look a bit like one of the angry girlfriend I once had. Yeah, you know, he's a little bit sort of shivery when I see a martial eagle. Our plan this afternoon, other than avoiding the wetness, oh dear, my phone is now talking to me. Every single time I come out on drive, Siri of the phone decides it needs to talk to me, which is very disconcerting. Anyway, our plan is to head off to the now to the east. We've come to Lookout Hill to look for some lions, didn't find any. We're going to the east where we have reports from our fearless technical genius, Jared Jennings, who says that there are hundreds of thousands of wildebeest there in the far east of the Mara, so that's where we're going now. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Hmm. Kimberly, what a very good question. You said, do all us guides have proper rain protection? 
Uh, I'm going to go along with no, none of us have proper rain protection. This is because we live in Africa. Now, there are a couple of things that happen when you live in Africa. The first thing, especially if you live in South Africa, or in Kenya, is that you get amnesia when bad weather happens. So, for example, in Johannesburg, where I live, it's cold for three months of the year. Nobody is prepared for the cold, but they forget on the 1st of September that it has been cold, and so they never sort themselves out. The same goes for rain. It's mostly dry, which means that when it does rain, it's always an enormous surprise and everyone gets wet. Let's head back across to the small chief with Tristan. I think we have a 19 second delay today, so I'm not sure how long I'm going to have to keep waffling before you're able to go across to him. Uh, uh, Alice, Alice, tell me, tell me how long. Alice? Oh, we're not doing a countdown. We can just stop speaking and then you'll link when you're ready. Okay, bye. See you later. <laughs> well, James, I can understand the 19 seconds is not very easy as well. We have it on our side too, so it's kind of waffle on for 19 seconds as we wait to go across to you guys. So I understand full well how it goes. But you can see Osana is not really interested in too much at the moment. Still panting, there's vehicles coming in. But what I have noticed, which is quite nice, is just off to my right hand side here, Seb, if you can have a look for me, as the guaris are starting to flower, which is fantastic news. So here is a guari tree over on this side. And these guys will start flowering now that you can see the little flowers. And after that, we will then get little fruits that will start coming out. And those fruits are going to be perfect for a number of different birds and it's really a great time of the year because the guaris start to become a huge hive of activity and I'm so excited because things are about to start changing in the next little bit where we're going to start getting amazing views of insects coming and flowers coming out and it's going to be really a fantastic time of the year so good to see that spring is starting and that we are starting to see these kind of plants the other plant that I'm hoping that we're going to start seeing flowering here I've seen a few flowering already on my way in this afternoon but not in the Juma section is the boar beans and they are such a beautiful plant when they flower they've got these bright maroon flowers that come off the tree and it's just laden with them it really is very pleasant unfortunately our sausage tree doesn't flower because they also have a beautiful maroon flower and when the sausage tree flowers those trees become just the most epic place Places to spend time. I remember when I was down at Lion Sands, we used to have these beautiful big sausage trees on the Sabi River there, and you'd find the, the multitude of animal species and bird species and insects that used to go to those trees was just absolutely phenomenal. And it was there that I learned that the sausage tree, funny enough, is pollinated primarily by bats. So fruit bats at night go up into the flowers and they feed off the nectar and then off to the next tree, and that's how pollination happens with the sausage trees. So birds and insects will help, but it's mostly bats that actually do the work, which is pretty interesting. But Hosanna keeps looking up. I think it's getting to that time. The temperature has really kind of cooled off quite nicely now. It's not nearly as warm as what we had at the start of the drive. Hosanna obviously is looking at me to, just to say, speak for yourself. You don't have a fur coat wrapped around you. But it definitely is getting a lot cooler now. There's a bit of a breeze and it's starting to become a lot more pleasant. And I'm hoping that this is going to lead to him starting to maybe go up into the tree. He keeps looking up at that Steenbok. And I think the promise of nice fresh meat instead of this rotten impala that he's had for two days is proving to be quite tempting so he keeps looking up there and I reckon that we're going to see him maybe going up into the tree fairly soon no, I wonder if he hasn't seen Tandi moving around and he's now gonna go that way or he just wants a drink of water interesting because Tandi is straight where he's walking now so on the other side of this riverbed is where Tandi is so what I might do is actually sneak across no we're going to lie down there for now but isn't it beautiful with that golden light? Very nice. Now he's just settled down that side. I think what we should do is maybe try and just do a little loop round back to Tandy and see what she's up to. Adele, this is an interesting question and one that I, I I don't have an exact answer for and I can't provide you with a, a exact answer but you want to know will Hosanna become sexually mature earlier because of his independence at such an early age well 
probably yes probably he will start to look, seek out females a lot earlier and try and establish himself a lot earlier given that he's been on his own for for a long period of time but there is a, a little bit of a physical sort of side of it he's got to get bigger before he's able to actually mate but there is a really interesting example of young male leopard mating and that's down in the south of the sabi sands at the moment there's a, a cub from the recently deceased white dam female and as far as i know i think it's from him and taylor will know better than i will but he seems to be a young individual that's mating with all the females down there even though there is a presence of big males like shovo and mashaben and, and these guys that are big adult males he somehow has wormed his way in there and even though he's not fully grown yet he seems to have somehow done it so i, I would imagine with hosana yes he will start coming into a system where he'll start to try and come into mating a little bit earlier but there's also a physical side of things where he's going to have to dominate an area and keep other males at bay in order to successfully mate with females so he might get lucky every now and then and find a female and there's no other males anywhere nearby and he can mate for a day or two but i reckon that he's still got some time until that happens i would say only when he reaches about three and a half at the earliest is he going to get lucky normally you'll find male leopards only four or five when they start actually mating properly with females and actually starting to produce offspring now our Hosanna has turned his back to us and is facing the opposite way so as I was saying earlier I think I'm gonna go back around to where Tundi is just to go and have a little look and see what she's up to and see if she's not looking around and while we do that let's go across to Miss McCurdy and see if she can do her best crown crane impression with the flock that she's in this is so amazing. I'm so excited right now. I've never seen crowned cranes before. And we haven't just got one. We've got three. How cool is this? Now, I wouldn't, I don't even know what to tell you about them. But I'm so excited. This is amazing. We literally just came around the corner. We were heading towards the jackal den. We're not far from the jackal den now either. And these three beautiful birds were just here waiting for us. And they're so close to the car as well. So I need to add this one to the list. I actually didn't even realize that they occurred here. How great is that? Now... <laughs> So Tristan, you friendly said you want me to do a crown crane impression. I don't even know what a crown crane sounds like, Tristan. I have, I have absolutely no idea. So what I might have to do is I might have to try and find the call on the interweb somewhere so that I can listen to it because my bird app, shall we check my bird app? I don't think it has got crown cranes on. In South Africa, we get the blue crane, which is our national bird. And thanks to Jar, he says that the crown crane is actually the national bird of Uganda. How exciting is that? So let's look. Let's see what crane I've got on my list. Maybe it's here. Maybe it will surprise me. Crane. Oh, it is. It is two. Okay. Let's hear the call. On. On. Is this it? I'm going to stop it because I'm getting the birds excited. <laughs> Sounds like a dog or a in distress. I actually don't know what that noise is. Now, of course, my phone is being Tristan. Tristan is sending me voice notes now, obviously, to say, this is probably what Tristan said to me. Taylor, stop being a sissy. Just do a crown crane impression, for goodness sake. I don't know how to do one. That's amazing. That's the first time I've heard that. But what spectacular birds we have here. Now, I hope you get some good screenshots of them as well. Um, I would love to, of course, see these pictures a little bit later. Now, Mr. P, you say, wow, just beautiful. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Oh, listen. Something's got them excited. Look how cool is that? wonder what's given them a bit of a fright. Now they seem to be relaxing, though. Back down on the ground, pecking away. Now, if they're like the other cranes, look, look how alert they are. That's incredible when they pop their heads up like that. That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> this is so cool. So I would only presume that they eat a variety of different things, like the blue cranes, so from insects to small invertebrates, maybe even mammals like little rats and mice, maybe. I don't know. Now, P heart, you're wondering if they're the same as crested cranes? I think they are. I think crowned or crested is acceptable, and, and that is, of course, the absolute norm. My hair is now blowing 
bikes everywhere because I was trying to take one or two pictures before you came to us because I was obviously so excited. And I've never seen these birds before, so I obviously had to get a few sneaky snaps in. Let me fix my hair. Isn't that the most annoying thing? Anybody that has long hair out there will know that the wind just manages to grab the little wispy bits and put in your eye, tickle your nose, get in your ears. It's never quite nice. That is so cool. I, c I cannot believe that I saw them. I didn't even think that I would see these birds out here. But again, I haven't really had too much opportunity to go through my books and look at all the different birds. So what a wonderful surprise. But I think what we're going to do now is we're going to head towards the jackal den and have a quick look around and see if the jackals are home. But I'm going to send you back across to Tristan. Uh, I'm not sure where he's going, but seeing as though he's giving me a lot of grief about doing the crown crane call, I'm sure he'll be excited to do one himself. Oh, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. I'll do one once you do one. I sent you a voice note, actually, quickly, just to give you an idea of what to do. So once Taylor does her crown crane, then I'll follow suit and do mine, too. Oh, did she do one? She did do one. Okay, Taylor, I will do one just now. But I've got just to head somewhere quickly. Before I do anything, I just want to try and see if we can't find Shadow, who apparently is somewhere just down this road, not far from where we are. So we're just quickly having a little look to see if Shadow is maybe also going to join the party this afternoon, and we'll just have a trifecta of leopards. We said we might have three, and we called Tingana earlier, but maybe we'll just get Shadow as well. So while Hosanna and Tandi are sleeping, and there's a number of other vehicles that want to come and see those two, so we thought we'd just take a leave of absence for a little bit and try and see if we can't have look and find shadow she was seen crossing the main road towards our side so hopefully she is here somewhere Seb you're gonna have to look out nicely also I have absolutely no idea how a crown crane goes I have seen crown cranes luckily in Botswana they're a beautiful bird but I actually have no idea what their call sounds like I'm much like Taylor in that I don't know I'll have to try and get the app out and listen to the call before mimicking Seb you still on there yeah good there's a very nasty tree route on Shabamu Road these days and when you drive over it it's very unpleasant and the poor cameraman gets flicked off the back at a rate of knots so I always have to try to go a little slower over there. I sometimes forget the other day poor Senzo, I was trying to get to Shongila and poor Senzo was on the back and we almost lost Senzo that day, he luckily held on to the camera. Alright so somewhere here apparently is where she was seen. I wonder if she's not just cruising around on the road. Let's just quickly check the tracks here. Okay, so no tracks leading that direction. Maybe she's just crossed briefly and gone back again. We'll soon find out. As, as soon as we find some sort of footprint, that will be able to tell us where exactly she's gone. But wouldn't it be insane if she did arrive at Treehouse Dam with the rest of them? So Monique in London, hello Monique, I hope you're well. Monique came and visited us here a few months ago. So I hope you're well Monique and Villiers, I actually saw him just now and I'm sure he sends his best as well. But Monique, you say I need to find her for you. I know when you were here, you were desperate to see Shadow and we tried very hard to find her while you were here and unfortunately we didn't. But we'll try our very best Monique and hopefully I will find her here somewhere. But I don't see any sign of her tracks yet coming over, so I don't know if maybe she crossed straight over the road and into one of these thickets, which will make things a little bit more difficult. But let's try nonetheless and see. Maybe we get lucky. It's worth a shot anyway. Like I said, there was others that wanted to... Charles, you're wondering if Shadow's Cub has got a name yet? Not as far as I know, Charles. Still a little bit young for that. Normally get named at around a year old, so January would be a year for that cub. Um, so a few more months until it will receive a official name, but nothing as yet. Nobody's really done it, and unfortunately it won't be up to us to name Shadow. She had the cub on Arethusa, and, and in all likelihood they will be the guys that will end up naming that cub. So it will go to a vote at a head rangers meeting and somewhere around then we'll get an answer as to whether or not she, what the name is and what the options are. So hopefully it will be something good. I'm sure it will be. The guys generally come up with quite cool ones. 
We'll have to just get the spelling right and consult James and Brent, who always are very good with that kind of stuff. Now, I don't see any sign of her. I don't see any tracks even. Hmm. Tony, you say Shadow is a fitting name right now? Well, most certainly. Shadow has got to be one of those leopards that I've probably spent more hours looking for and not found than any of the others. I've really spent a lot of time tracking her, particularly on Arethusa. And Arethusa is a tough place to track, particularly that northern side and even Simambili, that area. There's a lot of small drainage sections that are very dense, very thick bush areas, and they are really tough to find a leopard in. So it's quite a quite a hard place and and she's notoriously difficult with it she often doesn't walk on roads so she'll just cut over and into a thicket like this and then walk through that way so you've got to just get kind of lucky and bump into her from time to time or if she's got a carcass that's normally the easiest way to find shadows if she somehow has a carcass and you don't generally have a big window with shadow when she's got a carcass because very seldom does she actually hoist the carcass most of the time her carcasses are on the ground and generally get robbed by hyenas so you normally only have a you know the morning or the afternoon to find her if she does have has she, if she's made a kill during the night right Seb I don't see anything this side hmm I wonder Let's just do a loop around, maybe we'll get lucky. So Melissa, you're wondering if leopards will kill leopard cubs like the lions do? Most certainly. So there used to be a male in this area called Mafufunyan. And Mafufunyan in fact was actually Karula's father. And Mafufunyan used to have a nasty habit of killing male cubs for some reason even when they were tiny i remember the one day i was we had uh, tracked in tima who was a female that occurred south of us pretty much where shadow hangs out these days so that kind of area and in tima had just had new cubs and we had spent hours trying to find the den and we had had no not really much luck and all of a sudden and we had this kind of kill and there were the cubs and Intima and Mufufunyan they were all together and everything seemed really great and we kind of left them that night and everything was fine went back the next morning and they'd finished the kill and everyone had moved off and so we followed the tracks for Intima and, and, and the cubs and we tracked and we tracked and we tracked and the more we tracked you know we couldn't find her and she was moving quite a bit and Mufufunyan's tracks kept into kind of secting on these tracks and eventually late in the drive we managed to find her on foot and as we drove the vehicles in Mufufunyan ran in and he actually grabbed both of the cubs and killed them in front of us and then both of those cubs were male cubs and he used to do it quite regularly which was quite strange and I know with Tingana he's killed a couple of his own cubs as well which is which is odd but in terms of other males if other males had mated then they most certainly will kill let's say hypothetically in a situation Tandi now breeds with Tingana and Anderson moves in here he will kill those cubs to bring her back into estrus and that's why you'll find with female leopards and female lions they both do this is that they'll go way outside of their territories and they'll find different males and they'll mate with those in those areas to try and then ensure that if there's a male that comes in from the fringes and outskirts of their territory that they're also fooled into thinking that those cubs are theirs so it's quite interesting how the females do it I remember Karula who, who used to be dominant here on Juma we used to see her sometimes all the way on the Londa Lozi Sangita elephant plains boundary which is way 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 out of her territory oh no don't fly so fast maybe it will land there's a little sparrow hawk that's just come over or a goshawk. I'm just trying to see if it's going to land. It's just drifting away in the distance there. No, it's gone a bit far. Sorry, Seb. But you can just see it through there. Very difficult to ID one of these occipiters when they move that quickly. But you can hear a lot of the birds alarm calling as it's going. So we'll try and go down. It's actually going towards where I want to head. So maybe we'll find it sitting in a tree somewhere that side. I know there's a pair of Gabar goshawks that actually spends time in this area. And so maybe, just maybe, we will find them sitting somewhere. Now I must congratulate Byron on his bird challenge. While I, when I left, he was in the midst of his challenge and trying very hard to find some sort of sign of any bird to add to his numbers. And he managed to do it really well. So super happy for him, 100 birds in 
two weeks at this time of the year is really quite difficult so he's done quite well I'm very impressed and hopefully all the summer migrants will start coming back and the birding will become a lot easier now I'm going to try and see if I can't find Shadow and while I do that let's quickly jump across to Scott and see whether he's regained visual of those cheetahs is showing you this dramatic and beautiful scene as the sun starts to dip down to the west sunset will be in about half an hour or so I do not know if we'll see it setting but certainly it is creating some magical views in the meantime we've got a few wildebeest and Tommies dotted on the horizon and it's a very calm, peaceful, and exceptionally still afternoon. It is an absolute cracker of a day here, or it has been. And thankfully, it seems like the rain that was looking quite... Oh, what is the word I'm looking for? It was looking like it was coming straight for us, basically. And it has veered off to the east, so I think we are safe from the rain for now but we did take some precautionary measures and just drop one flap on the left hand side of the vehicle in case it starts raining we will be ready to deploy the flaps quickly oh there's a topi running through the wildebeest and zebra Lisa you've just commented wow just stunning and I couldn't agree more it really is a magical magical scene we are enjoying here if you go to the left a tiny bit Manu well there's some ox peckers yeah it looks like there's some ox peckers sitting on the back of although no those look possibly they could actually be wattled starlings they also sit on the backs of zebras but they're enjoying the sunset from oh no those are ox peckers I think who glean off the parasites and take the odd ride on whichever animal they've decided to clean off their parasites. A very handy feature for a lot of these herbivores. Now, Taylor was heading off to the hy not hyena den, a jackal den, and I think she's just arrived, so why don't you get an update from her on whether it's active or not. Sadly, it is not active. I'm confused. The same thing this morning happened. We arrived, we sat for a little bit, but uh, unfortunately nothing really came out to greet us. And I haven't seen the adults around, so I don't know if they've maybe moved den sites. I, I can't imagine that they would have moved because of us. We've kept our distance every single time. Uh, I mean, I've only really sat once with them and viewed them when we found them at night we spotted them from the distance we actually left them alone because there were so many other predators in the area we didn't want to attract them to this den site because they will kill them and then the other morning we arrived they got a bit nervous but one came out and, and was very relaxed and we stopped at a, a very similar distance but it wouldn't surprise me if they maybe just moved to another den around here they do do that like hyenas the same thing happens well and with warthogs and aardvark a lot of parasites build up in these dens and it can become a little bit unpleasant and we know that like hyenas they like to move every few weeks or so and jackals will do a similar thing so i think what i'm going to do is i might come through here one night when we've got the infrared and come and have a look around here and scan and see if we can't see any movement from the adults because if those youngsters are with only a couple of weeks old I think I said I thought they were maybe about nine weeks old or so maybe they're even a little bit less than that but that's also coming to the age where they'll start to leave the den they weren't tiny little things obviously they were very sweet and very fluffy but you could already start to see the black sort of stripe developing over their shoulders right down towards their tail so I thought that maybe they were a little bit older uh, and then it wouldn't be surprised if they did actually move on and start following the adults around maybe we just caught the den too late but we'll keep searching i don't think they would have gone far jackals also hold territories so they should be somewhere around here i did a bit of reading and they said in this area the average size jackal sort of territory is about two or blackback jackal territory is about two and a half kilometers squared so that's not huge it's manageable so we'll keep coming and checking around here but just think we need to count ourselves lucky how um how incredible it was just to get that one view you. Yeah.
The CT is now, our oh, Ascari is pointing at something. Let me just check with my binoculars. Let's just see what we can see in the distance. Have you seen something? Let's see if we can spot. No, Nasiti, like I said, he's a, a scary. He's got unbelievable eyesight. Ah, I think I see a Thompson's gazelle moving in the grass, sort of in that direction. I wonder if that was not what we've seen. Yeah, I think it is. There's a couple of Thompson's gazelle around. Okay. Well, we'll keep searching. We might head back towards uh, the lions now to see if they have perhaps gotten up. A little bit of a drive, though. I'm going to send you back across to Tristan, who is now searching for a leopard by the name of Shadow. Well, we were searching for her, but no sign that I can see. I can't find any tracks of her crossing, so I don't know if she just went straight back to the south again or... If she's come up towards Treehouse Dam, I can hear a squirrel alarm calling. So I want to just stop at the dam here for a second and just listen. It might, of course, be Tandi or Hosanna that are in the tree now. It could be causing them to be a little bit on edge, but I don't see anything. It would be amazing, though, if Shadow did arrive. To have the three of them would be quite interesting. I don't know. Right here. Right here? Yeah. Oh, there's a leopard right here. <laughs> Let me reposition for you, Seb. You're going to have a lot easier if I reposition. So, the squirrel was alarm calling, but I don't know if that's Shadow. Uh, it could be Tundi. It looks like Tundi to me from the top, but of course that could be completely wrong. But I don't think Tundi and Shadow have met up since they become... They kind of separated and went on their own ways. I don't know if there's a recorded sighting of them doing that, so... Let's see if we get in here, Seb. But it's going to be a bit of foliage in the way. But oh, look at that light! Isn't that magnificent? That is unbelievable. Beautiful. There is something about cats drinking in light like this that is just phenomenally good. I don't know why. I always just like seeing them when they drink in this orange, orange light. It is beautiful. You can see, I'm sure she's going to be very thirsty after sitting in the sun all day long. But that is as good as it gets, I would say. But you can see, so... We were talking earlier about how frequently they would drink water. Well, the answer to that is very frequently, particularly on a hot day like today. So I'm not surprised that she's here. Um, it's maybe why Hosanna actually started to move earlier is because he heard the squirrel's alarm calling and Tundi moving in this direction to drink water. So it could be why he came out this way. And I wouldn't be surprised if he actually comes to investigate what's happening. But she couldn't have chosen a better spot to drink. That light is ridiculously good. Seb doesn't get much better than that, does it? Now she's just... So Noel, you're wondering why leopards have light underneath their eyes and cheetahs have dark underneath their eyes well no the reason for that is because cheetah activity generally is more during the day so that darker pattern underneath the eye just helps to reduce the glare of the light of the sun and in the grass whereas the leopards are active more at night and so a lighter coloration will just help to bring light into the eye and to wait it is shadow it's shadow look at that so we've got the third one. <laughs> That's amazing, Seb. <laughs> um, let me just let the guys know. That's ridiculous. Hello, Shadow. What are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, Shadow is pushing mighty at Treehouse Dam if anyone's interested. Um, that's crazy. What are the chances of having Shadow, Tandi, and Hosanna within this little bit? That's crazy. Hello, Shadow. <laughs> what a way to come back to work. Three leopards in one afternoon is ridiculous.
That is about as good as it gets. Now, I'm just gonna try and reverse. There she goes, she's walking off. I was thinking when she was drinking there for a second that she didn't look quite as full-bellied as what Tundi did earlier. But it's most definitely Shadow and I'm so happy to see her from this pure point of view that she's walking so much better than the last time I saw her. The last time I saw her, that foot was being held up. She was not even moving at all. It was really didn't look good. But now she's basically got her foot moving. She's putting weight on it. That is fantastic news. So I'm super happy to see that she's walking the way that she is. That is great, great news. Well done Shadow and apparently she's had a few kills lately which is fantastic so it really is the most epic thing. Now I wonder where her cub is, hopefully her cub is somewhere around as well. I wonder if she's going to pick up the scent maybe of Tandi or Hosanna and actually go towards them. Wouldn't that be quite something to see the two sisters come together? Like I say I would love to know when the last time the two sisters were seen together in this particular well in, in ever because i don't know of a sighting of the two sisters together since the way we were with karula as cubs so that could have been now what, what seven years ago since that happened so it'll be really interesting to see the interaction between these two for at this stage she's not really going in the direction of tundi or Hosanna, she's kind of moving her way actually the opposite direction, but interesting nonetheless that she's so close and I feel like there is going to be a meeting of the sisters at some point soon. But I'm so happy that she's not walking as badly as she was last time. She really is walking a lot better now. That's great news, sure. David, you're wondering if Tundi's a threat to Shadow's Cub? Well, theoretically, yes. So once they become separated like this and they no longer are sort of cub mates and they become adult females, they no longer want anything to do with one another. They'll actually become competition for area and territory and they will then fight with one another and cubs will be a part of that. So it does happen that they will fight with the cubs and they will go after one another. So it, it is something that we will see. If Tandi does see the cub, she might be aggressive towards it. It's exactly like she was with Shongile. Where are you going? Now there's a beautiful termite mound coming up. And that termite mound, I've always wanted to see a leopard on top of it. So I wonder if today is the day that we're going to see shadow going up onto the termite mound. It's just in front of us, that big tree that you see over there. The termite mound is at the base of that. So I'm hoping that's where she's gonna head. Just going to have to be careful on the left, Jesse. Yep. Ali, you want to know if I saw Shadow as a cub? Unfortunately, not, Ali. When I first got here, Tundi and Shadow were about three and a half years old, so they had just gone independent. In fact, within the first five months of me being here, Tundi had her first litter of cubs, so I got to see Tundi's first litter when there were still actually two of them, and then unfortunately she lost the one, and then she had Wabayiza, who was eventually then killed by the Styx Pride. So I didn't get to see them as cubs, unfortunately, but I did see them when they were still much younger individuals than what they are now. But how cool is this? What a way to come back to work. Three leopards, all of the Karula lineage as well. What a, what a wonderful day. And of course we are completely forgetting about the lions. The whole Inkahuma pride is also not very far from here either. They're on Weaver's Nest, so it's not a big distance from where we are now. <sighs> what are the chances, Seb? Mike, you're wondering if it's possible that Shadow is shadowing other leopards um, because of her injuries. Um, Mike, no, I don't think so. I think, if anything, she's going to try and avoid other leopards as much as possible. She's not in full fitness, which means that she can't kind of keep up with a lot of these leopards and can't actually fight and protect herself as well as she would if she was fully fit. So I would imagine that she's trying to actually avoid leopards more than she's trying to go anywhere near them. And that means that she's probably trying to just fly under the radar and it's also could be why she's maybe sniffed out Tandi and Hosanna and has gone the opposite direction she doesn't seem to be salivating in any way or scent marking which means that she's not too stressed about any of the sort of 
smells that she's come across often when they smell another female they'll start to salivate heavily they'll start calling they'll start making a lot of noise but she doesn't seem to be doing that but I don't think she'll want to be near other leopards because remember other leopards potentially means that she's gonna have to fight if she has to fight that could then worsen that injury or if she has a situation where um, she kills something it might get stolen from her so better for her to stay away from everybody else and to just try and fly under the radar until she's fully healed but she is walking I can't even tell you infant it, the, the difference between when we saw her last time and now is indescribable there literally was not one ounce of weight being put on that leg a few weeks ago and now she's walking it's a little bit of a limp and it's one that I would expect from her but it's not something that in any way is going to hinder her ability to survive she'll quite easily be able to still hunt on that she'll have enough adrenaline to get up into trees if there was a threat of other lions or, or other leopards should I say and, and lions so she's doing so much better and the prognosis for her to survive is that much better now that she's walking like this you can see she's fully resting on those front feet which is fantastic and I love this is my favorite thing about leopards when they curl their tail like that that is one of the best things when it's up in the air and they curl it in that bright white particularly in golden light like we're in now and it shows and it's kind of silhouetted it is the best thing and the reason why she's doing it is because gray go away birds and squirrels have alarm called at her and so she's now trying to just show them I'm not in any way a threat leave me alone do not shout at me I'm not going to hunt you careful there Seb We've got to careful our ear pieces because we don't have any more left and I broke a whole bunch last cycle so let's try not to do that this cycle Seb you'll have to remind me when we off-road because otherwise you know how I get Chastity, you say that Seb and myself need to get a lottery ticket. What have you spotted, girl? You've spotted something because her demeanor has changed completely. You see how she's gotten a bit lower, a little bit more fixed on the, what's ahead of us. I wonder if she's not spotted a Steenbock or a Dyker somewhere in here. Wouldn't that be something if she caught the partner Steenbock to the one that Tundi caught? That would be quite a weird scenario, but one that could happen. But Chastity, I think so. I think today would be the day. Pity we didn't play the lottery the other day in the United States, the $736 million or whatever it was. That would have been quite something to win, Seb. What would we have done? A lot. A lot. <laughs> Travel a lot. Exactly. Seb, I'm going to move forward a bit for you so you can see her face. But yes, that would have been quite nice. Maybe we should get a lotto ticket. Seb and I will get a lot lotto ticket and we'll have to let all of you guys know if we manage to actually win anything because that would be quite funny if we did. Of course, it wouldn't stop me from doing what I do and Seb and I were actually having this conversation today because I brought Seb back from town this morning and we were talking about how we love doing what we do and we wouldn't do it even if we were older and in retirement age that we'd probably both still be in the bush because, well, we just enjoy being out here and, and so even I think if we had money at won a lottery like that, I don't think it would change too much from my side. Seb, I'm sure you'd still want to film wildlife all over the world. Buy the best camera. <laughs> so Seb says you'll buy the best camera and then go filming wildlife everywhere. Okay, Seb. Well, we'll have to see. We'll have to try and play the lottery later. James, you're saying with Salahesh's territory now open um, that maybe Shadow will just relinquish this Juma area for Tandi and move into that area and avoid the conflict. James, um, I don't think so. And, and the reason why I say that is because even though Shadow potentially um, could move into that area, there's by no means no conflict that side. She, if she goes there, she's still going to have to try and fight with Tiani. She's going to have to try and fight with Ingrid Dam, young female Ingrid Dam, Moya. Um, and Sele, um, who else is around that side? That's about it in terms of the females that would, would be able to kind of put up resistance. So those are all big girls. They're not small. That lineage, Salesh's lineage is not small individuals. And in fact, Tiani is bigger than Shadow already now. So she would have her work cut out pushing towards Salesh's area. And I don't think she would go there. 
you never know though I, I remember when i was at simambili that we used to have shadow drinking in front of the lodge sometimes which is way 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 out and that was when she was mating um quite a lot with with anderson so it's possible but i don't think so i think she knows the core of her territory she knows areas very well and she'll want to keep those as much as possible for herself so i don't think that we're going to get a situation that she's going to try and move into salacious territory it's far more likely that tiani ingrid dam young female in sele moya they start to control in chile they start to control salacious territory and each one takes a chunk of it rather than somebody taking that whole territory much like what we've seen now with karula's territory is that slowly but surely females are gleaning off chunks of this territory so Sh shadow is here at trias dam and taking most of this western side tandy seems to be trias dam to the east and to the north we're seeing Tiani and in Chile moving into those areas every now and then. I mean, they, we haven't seen them much on our drives, but they have been seen in Wilfels Hook. So, you know, chunks get kind of portioned off to the females that are on the on the, the fringes of those territories. So I don't think she's going to end up going that way. And, and certainly not now that she has an injury. She's going to try and stay in the core of her territory and try and heal and, and nurse that injury back to health and get herself into into physical good physical condition before she goes tries to expand anything but just on the Salah note I actually spoke to to the guys that had a copy of her post-mortem I'm sure a lot of you are interested as to what actually caused her death they're still unsure um, it's not a defined reason yet but basically she had a number of health concerns and and because she was an aging individual a lot of that health sort of issues together combined caused for her probably to die so she she did have a bit of bleeding inside the stomach which could have happened from a fall or even an altercation with another animal um, even in a kill maybe she you know something like an impala rolled on top of her and caused a bit of that she had porcupine quills stuck under her coat not in her throat like has been reported so there was no porcupine quills in the throat she had porcupine quills in her coat that were a little bit infected she had an enlarged liver and she also had a few lesions on her lungs which could be a sign of tuberculosis which is quite common in older cats so those kind of things all together coupled with that cold front that we had at the time would all be very sort of interesting or could be causes for her to die they have done some more tests just to check if she wasn't particularly maybe poisoned by blue green algae because blue green algae will bloom in dry conditions like this and there's a dam very close to where she was that does show quite a lot of that blue green algae and in in large quantities could be toxic to her um, but it's very very seldom reported in cats and it's, and it's very seldom that it actually it, that has effect on cats so they don't think it's that it's just a combination of her being slightly older and a number of other issues that were going on that led to her to her death so it's nothing untoward it's just one of those natural things but shadow is looking ever so beautiful in the long grass and wow we have been spoiled this afternoon it has been absolutely incredible and you know we've got Hosanna and Tandy and shadow but in the Mara Scotty Dyson has got the other spotted cats to show all of you now I believe we're not going to Scott so we're going to stay with Shadow because she's now starting to stalk a little bit so she you can see she's kind of watching there's another vehicle on the other side there I don't know if maybe there like I say is a steering book or a diker or something inside here that she's watching I can't see anything so can you see anything but the guys on the other side don't seem to see anything so she's watching something you know they, their vision is just that much better than ours and sometimes they can pick up these animals a little bit further but she's definitely noticed something like I say, her whole demeanor has changed. You can see she's quite skinny still, but that is because of that injury. She's not going to be feeding as regularly. But like I say, she has come off quite a number of impala carcasses. I've, I know of three now that she's had in the last three weeks. So she's doing quite fine. But you're being very well behaved today. Both of you and your sister, you haven't been growly at all. So there's always this kind of misconception that Shadow and Tandy are aggressive cats. And... You can see that she's in no way been shown any aggression towards us, nor has she shown, or did Tandy show any aggression towards us at all. They're cats that, given the right amount of space, and, and if you're quiet and you don't move around too much around them, are perfectly fine. It's only when you kind of stand or you make too much noise do they get a little bit on the upside, upset side. It seems like she's settled down again and is just watching into this thicket so we'll sit with her a little bit and be patient I'm also keeping an ear out to here if maybe Hosanna or Tandy goes into the tree 
And so while we do that, let's try this time to go across to Scotty and his five male cheetahs and hopefully they'll be up to something interesting. Hello everyone, the Musketeer Coalition are on the move and heading to one of their usual crossing points. We tried to get some low angles to show you them silhouetted, but they've just not gone high enough up onto that ridge. It is a very, very moody afternoon with some thunder and lightning off in the distance. And thankfully for now, none of that is appearing to be here. Like I say, I think these guys are going to cross what is called the Talek River. It's a fairly small little tributary that runs into the Mara River, but sometimes it is uncrossable for both us and them. It's one of my favorite off-roading areas, having to cross the specific river. We've had some fairly hairy and exciting crossings in order to stay with these guys. Oh, we need to rush you back to Juma. Unfortunately, with the delay, our diker has run away. So there was a diker right here that she was stalking, and she was within, I would say, about nine meters of that diker, but it then ran away, and she's missed, unfortunately. But look at that setting sun and then shadow just strolling past. Sorry, my girl. But that was very close. She got, like I say, within maybe nine, eight, nine meters before the diker ran away. And she unfortunately came around a bush and I didn't think she expected the diker to be as close as it was because she kind of stopped and the diker was just staring straight at her and she didn't really have any cover to hide behind at that point. But nonetheless, still exciting stuff to see. Um, Seb, which way are we going to go? I wonder if she's not going to carry on hunting this. Sometimes this is what leopards do is they, they do this initial chase and, and the diker runs off and then they just try and reposition themselves again and try and kind of work out a different angle to try and get towards that diker. So let's try and see if we can just stay with her. I want to try and avoid as much as possible making too much noise. Are you going to come back towards the road? I think let's go to the road, Seb, because she's coming towards the road. I'm going to go to the road and then I'm just going to sit on the road and wait for her to come out. I don't want to make too much noise. Careful there, Seb. It's so strange because this tree here on our left, as though it's almost like an indication, is the last time I saw Karula, Hosanna and Shongile together. So now to have shadow here is just an indication of just how far they're starting to push into Karula's territory and chunks that they're gleaning off of it. Where is she now? Oh, I've missed her. Sky, you wondering if she could scavenge for food while she's injured? Sky, yes, she could. Um, she would be able to scavenge quite easily. Um, if she came across, let's say, something like Shongile, who had a carcass, she would be able to then scavenge from Shongile and probably steal that away from her. Um, if it's a smaller leopard or if she comes across some scraps that another leopard has left behind but you can see how difficult they can be to see look at how she goes through that long grass it's not as easy as you would think and if she stops dead still right now and you're driving to see that is really quite tough there she goes look at that just melts into the bush the perfect coloration so she could scavenge but there's a risk in scavenging because if you're scavenging often there's others that are in that area that are also scavenging and the likes of um, hyenas and and other predators like lion or leopard that could also be around and that could lead to you getting into a lot of trouble so you might find a situation where and they will try and kind of just avoid that area and like I say she's gonna try and lay low as much as possible but I don't think we're going to be able to follow her much more. She's going through this horrible thicket on my right-hand side. It really is very dense. So I think we're going to leave her there and let her carry on with the afternoon and let her try and see if she's successful. It really is very thick in there, and it's not a place that we're going to be able to spend too much time. Oh, there she is. Can you still see her, Seb? Yeah, um, she's heading deeper in now. So I don't think we're going to get too much more of her. You can see, look at how many trees and branches and foliage there is between us and her. It's going to make life almost impossible to follow. Awesome though, nonetheless. What an epic way to start a cycle at work. If, any, if this is anything to go by, we're going to be having a really incredible next few weeks. And it's one of the reasons why I like this time of the year 
is because of the dryness of the bush and the lack of water and it means that everybody's got to come into certain areas and that's why we're getting a concentration around treehouse dam because not only predators but prey animals too come in here and so it's really going to be an epic few weeks as we go through this change in season now i rudely interrupted scott with his cheetahs i'm sure he would love to spend more time with all of you and them so let's go across to him and see what they're up to we are just getting into position to show you some last views of the Musketeer Coalition as they head north to the west of them. It's quite a moody scene and there is certainly rain. I don't think it's going to be too serious here. The major storm seemed to have missed us. And these guys are heading towards one of their usual crossing points where they used like to cross the Talek River. I've had to follow them through this crossing point. It's quite hair-raising. It's good fun. I'm looking forward to taking Manu through there. And what we'll do is we'll film it and then I'll post that on one of my, maybe on my Facebook page or on my Instagram so you guys can see what that crossing is like. Sadly, there's no signal and it's even a little bit shaky where we are here. We're in a bit of a low-lying area. So we have not been able to take you on... And I'm guessing the Thompson's Gazelle. Philip, um, you like to know what is the fastest prey species they'll try and take down. I'm guessing possibly a Thompson's Gazelle would be the fastest, but I cannot be 100% certain which is their fastest. I'm guessing it is that, though, in this area. These guys, though, have the benefits of taking down slightly larger, slightly slower prey. Wildebeest is their favorite source of food. At least it has been in the last months, last few months. The only other things we've seen them feed on is one... Oh, let's get the Tommy silhouetted there, straight ahead of us, or is it something else? Um, they've killed one Impala after dark and one to the right. front's dewlap flapping from side to side as it runs and it's got a few birds on its back but sadly the signal is no good so we are sending you back to Juma let's hope Shadow has a bit of luck with her hunting well unfortunately we've lost sight of Shadow so she's disappeared into that thicket so we've just come back to her sister and her younger brother basically so little Hosanna who's directly in front of me and hasn't really moved too much he hasn't gone up into the tree as I thought he might have I thought by this time of the afternoon he might have gone in but he hasn't he's still watching over towards the side maybe with all the commotion of the squirrels and the various other things he's been watching where shadow was and, and I wonder if Tandy hasn't just walked a little bit closer and that's why he's still kind of watching her you can see he's very intent in looking in that sort of westerly direction so I'm sure he's kind of checking out where she is and wondering what's going on. But he definitely hasn't been into that tree to feed. Neither of the carcasses have moved at all. So hopefully sometime soon he will be doing so. Petro, you want to know how we identify the different leopards. Well, Petro, I think everybody's got a slightly different way of doing it. The, the most scientific and, the, and the, the most reliable way is to use the spot patterns. So when I talk about the spot patterns, you see on Hosanna there above his whiskers, 
he's got three spots so three big black dots above the whisker line and those dots you count as three and then you'll count on the right hand side however many he's got and that will give you a spot pattern and it's unique to every single leopard so that spots above the the, the whisker line will be different on any leopard on the right and left side and the combination of those spots other people will use other markings around the eye area um, nicks in the ears notches in the ears um, any distinctive marking on the coat like Tingana with a smiley face on his left shoulder um, short tail Salahesh used to have a short tail the tip of her tail was taken off by hyenas so she had a slightly shorter tail so those are all different things but they also all have a different look about them so they all have a different shape of the face a different sort of body structure and earlier we said it was Tundi from the top but as we kind of got round and, and she stood up and she started to limp that was a definite sign that she was shadow and I was actually talking to Seb about it I said when we were looking at her at one point I, was, I wasn't 100% sure it was Tundi and I kind of just got into the moment of it and you were so excited about just seeing leopard in golden light drinking I didn't really think about it too much but it, some of them are quite similar and so that you would then use spot patterns to check but they all have kind of different looks so Hosanna has a, has a sort of darker colored eyes to me and has a kind of boxy face as opposed to Tumba who's a little bit stouter in this in the muzzle and greener colored eyes so the more we see them the easier it becomes for us to identify them because it's like when you see your dog if you buy a dog and you have your dog every single day and even if another dog that is very similar comes along you still can tell the difference between the two and that's how it comes with the leopards if you see them regularly you do get to kind of recognize them but the spot patterns is the best way to do it and so if you're still unsure about the spot pattern sort of way of things I'm going to try and show you a photo that I can explain it a little bit better because I know it can be sometimes quite tough when it comes to actually seeing these things on the animal and there's lots of spots all over their face so I'll just try and get you a, a spot pattern of a leopard and then I'll be able to explain to you what I'm talking about all right so let's use this one here Seb that's going to be the easiest one so if you have a look here this is Mvula that we've got and so the spots that I'm talking about are these three spots where my finger is so the one two and then the third one on top that creates that triangle now if we had to look at Hosanna he has a very different spot pattern on the right side of his face it won't look anything like that so I'll try and see if I've got a photo of one of the other leopards on the right side well uh, here's Shongile so you see Shongile she also does have a triangle but it's slightly different shape also her size and everything else will make it very difficult to be able to sort of mistake her and Mvula but that's basically the patterns that we use in order to be able to identify these leopards and to be able to show who they are or to recognize them and, and be able to know who is the individuals within this area Hosanna is definitely, I think you can see Tundi from wherever he's looking, I can't see her at all, it's getting to that time of the day where leopards are going to become very difficult to see, it's that strange light and their body colour just blends in with the grass as we saw with Shadow as she disappeared earlier and he might be able to see her from the line that he is but I definitely can't see any sign at the moment and she's now gone well he's now gone to sleep now this is very exciting so let's quickly jump across to scott dyson who's got some lions that i believe have encroached on the cheetah brothers and thankfully do next a lot of competition between them but sadly we are in a low signal Well, unfortunately, I apologize. There's a few little technical glitches, and I'm sure it's to do with the rainstorm 
that they were having in the Mara. But basically, there was a pride of lions that were chasing the five Cheetah brothers, and I believe the Cheetah brothers got away okay. But look, Hosanna has just bolted upright all of a sudden. I wonder if there's not something else that's lurking in this area. I know there's a hyena behind us at the moment, which we haven't managed to ID yet. We'll have to hope that that hyena stands up now that it's getting cooler. And maybe Tundi is walking through this drainage section, and we just can't see her. But he bolted upright as though he heard something. I can't see anything from where I am. Is there some Franklins there, Seb? Okay, yeah. so Seb has spotted some Franklins. So that's obviously caused him to bolt upright with the scratching in the grass. And when there's a number of other individuals around, one has to be quite careful. So when you've got things like other leopards and hyenas, you've got to be aware of your surroundings. So I suppose a Franklin could create a false alarm. But as I was saying with Scott, the cheetahs, I believe, got away safely, so all was okay there. The lions just kind of pushed them off, which is pretty much um, the way things go. With cheetahs, unfortunately, they do have to scuttle away from lions every now and then, but I'm glad that they're all okay and that they managed to get away. Hosanna, why are you watching the Franklins? You've got more than enough food. You don't need to worry about Franklins. I wonder... Come on, boy, it's time to go up and eat. I think he's too full at this stage for anything. I'm very surprised, though, that Tundi hasn't come back into this area and tried to move around. I'm just trying to see if I can spot Tundi, so I do apologize about my cap coming through the frame there. The way that we're parked at the moment, unfortunately, Seb is shooting straight over the bonnet, so sorry about that, Seb. But where we left Tundi is literally straight across from where I am now, so I can't see her at the moment. I'm sure she is still there. Maybe she's still just taking a bit of a nap and resting. But those ears are working overtime. You see how they're twisting and turning? As the wind blows, there's rustles in the leaves and the grass. And Osana is listening to all of this. Now you can hear the Franklins. So the Franklins are alarm calling at him. <laughs> Tony, you're wondering if cats are nearsighted or large cats? Uh, no, Tony, not as far as I know. I've seen leopards and lions spot animals from way in the distance that you and I would never be able to see. So they're able to see from a long way away as well as very close to them. So they've got, their vision is excellent throughout. And because they have the eyes on the front of their head, they have that binocular vision, which means that they can really see very well um, and judge depth very well. So they can see quite a long way into the distance. I've watched um, a leopard in a tree once that was uh, on a river system and we had a, a great field of views that we could see down the riverbed and that leopard reacted to a bushbuck that crossed the river that was probably I would say at least six to seven hundred meters downstream from where we are so really good eyesight and the only reason we spotted it is because my tracker was actually scanning with binoculars across the riverbed and he picked up this little dot crossing the river but the leopard most certainly saw it because its demeanor changed and it stared in that direction and really kind of looked carefully as much as possible so they do have incredible eyesight You can see that little dewlap is starting to form, like this little throat patch that's coming out at the bottom. Chitty chatty Meg, Oof. this is always a terrible one and I know a lot of you make fun of me about this but it's just the way it is. You want to know, do I have a favourite leopard? Uh, Chitty chatty Meg, all of the leopards are firm favourites of mine but female, adult females, most certainly Tandi is my favorite that we see in this area of the younger generation of females Tiani and then of the big males Hosanna I mean uh, Mr. Anderson and of the little males Tumba so those are my kind of top four I have a very big problem I can't really dislike any leopard I have I like them all and would love to spend time with all of them as much as possible and I was actually talking to Ali about it the other day I would Imagine what it would have been like to have spent pretty much 24 hours a day with the likes of Hosanna and Shingile and just see what they've gotten up to over the last few months and document this process as they've tried to survive on their own. It would be fantastic. So I have a problem that I like all leopards, but of the adult females, like I say, Tandi and, and of the big males, Anderson, but the younger generation, Tiani and Tamba. It's all teas, really. I wonder if there's something in that. <laughs> 
Except for Anderson, he breaks the mold. What are you stalking now? You can't stalk Franklin's. You've got two carcasses in the tree. Look how it's instinct. It's amazing to watch the instinct. Even just movements triggers him off. So, Darlene, I didn't hear you clearly. Well, I didn't hear Megan clearly, but I, I think you said what scents do they use mostly when hunting? Um, Lena, I think it, it depends on, on the situation. Sometimes they'll use their sense of smell. So I've seen leopard and lions often sitting and all of a sudden a gust of wind comes and their nose goes up and they pick up something and they go and they start heading in that direction. But once they actually sort of find where that animal is, eyesight becomes the, the predominant feature that they use. So they'll use their eyesight more than anything else. Their whiskers will also play a huge role, particularly in the nighttime, because what you'll find with them is those whiskers are, are, have sensory organs, and as they move through the grass, they're picking up vibrations. And so in the dark night, when they're trying to stay as low as possible and not give themselves away, and their eyes are just over the top of the grass, those whiskers are picking up what they can't see. So they will use whiskers a lot, but their eyesight is their predominant sort of sense when hunting. It's interesting because the smaller cats, so something like a serval, it's hearing is what it's going to use more than anything else. We've been fortunate enough and I know a couple of the guides have had servals hunting and catching mice and you'll see how those big satellite like ears just twist and turn, twist and turn, twist and turn until they hear and then they pounce on their prey items. So you'll find bigger cats like lion and leopard are more eyesight based but those smaller ones will use their hearing quite extensively to hunt. Oh, I think he's flopped back down. I thought for a second he might roll over and decide to start going towards the tree but it looks as though he's going to spend his evening as sleepy as possible. It just needs now for Tandy to arrive and I'm, I would have been very interested to have seen if Shadow had come here what would have happened between these three. I would have certainly thrown a spanner in the works and I don't know of any sightings of Hosanna and Shadow together so it would be quite interesting to see those two and whether or not they have come across one another and whether the shadow would be as tolerant as what Tundi has been so far. Right, it's time to start our school drive, so we're going to jump across to Miss McCurdy so she can say hello to everybody, and we'll see you all in a little bit. It's very exciting to have you all here. We've obviously got some new people who have joined us and it's the Jessamine County Public Library as well as Santa Rita Elementary all the way from Texas. Very, very happy to have you all this afternoon. Now it's quite dark here in Kenya at the moment. You can see that we're sitting with the pride of wonderful lions. How cool is this? Isn't this amazing? My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Ja and well like I said we're sitting in the Mara Triangle one of the wildest places in Africa and the lions have just started to wake up and in the far distance if you look you can see some buffalo I wonder if these lions are thinking about going and attempting to hunt one of them they were sitting down you can see they're getting up now and they're moving away hmm I wonder why they are. I wonder if they have seen the lions, maybe. Now the cubs, there are four of them. They look very excited. They're just all starting to play around now. They're climbing up on the termite mounds. You can see there's two different sets of cubs. The one set of cubs looks relatively old, maybe just over six months or so. I'm not familiar with these prides of lions just yet. So I'm just starting to learn them. And then the others look... Oh, so the other one looks like it's going to pounce. Look at the stalking. Ew! Jumping up and onto a sibling. So that's not a big lion, the one on the right. The others look like maybe they're three or four months old. They're quite young still. Maybe a little bit older than that. But the lionesses are just sitting back watching. They know how important it is, of course, to observe their prey because it's not an easy thing for them to go after. There's one adult. She's just sitting there now. Look how focused she is. See how her ears are pricked forward? She's watching those buffalo with intent. Now there isn't really too many zebra around or wildebeest, which is surprising because 
we are in the peak of the migration at the moment, but they seem to have moved off. So those zebra and the wildebeest, they are constantly moving around, searching for the greenest of green pastures. Pa pa I can't even say the words correctly, pastures, and also looking for new water sources. But I think they'll be back because we had did have lots and lots of rain over the last few days, so the grass should get nice and green this side. But they've gone to Tanzania for the moment, and hopefully they'll come back here. Now, Steph is sitting in the studio and he has got one of the scariest creatures out here that lives in the Mara River. Sorry about that. They've come back to us. Sorry, Ja. Um, we're going to reposition just slightly here. I don't know what happened with Steph. It seems as though he doesn't have any sound coming from his mouth, so he's probably just doing this. Don't worry. You will listen to my voice now. It's going to quickly go down here and try and get a better spot. Ooh, there's lots of zebra that have just joined the party now. That's going to be exciting. I'm going to go underneath so we can watch the lion cubs because the adults are just watching for the moment. And while they decide what they're going to do and what they're going to want to hunt, let's watch these lions as they climb around. And it's very, very cool with the dark skies. Let me see. I don't want to put too much light on them. Let me see if I can spotlight out. Just put a little bit of light on them. See, these cubs are quite young, especially the ones at the back, so I don't want to spot them. They're not going to be used to the light, so it'll just shine the light on the ground, and then a little bit of it will sort of head up towards them. But the others are coming. I'm just going to drop the spotlight. The others are also just moving in now. They're very excited though. Now they're too young to be hunting. Oh. Now, Gunnar, you're wondering at what age do lions get their manes? Well, it's a young boy, normally at about uh, just under a year or so, you'll start to see that they get hairy chests. Can you believe it? So they get fluffy, sort of bit of fluffiness underneath their necks. And only once they're about six or seven years old or so do they actually get their big proper manes that's fully grown. But we're going to see what these lions do. We're going to figure around and play around with the infrared. We won't put any more lights on them because it looks like they're going to maybe hunt something a bit later. I'm going to send you back across to Steph now and hopefully he'll actually be able to make sounds out of his mouth. Hello everybody and welcome to the river cameras here on the Mara River in Kenya. Quite close to where Taylor is although I am nowhere near to where she is at the moment. These are remotely controlled cameras that are located on the banks of this river and that means that we can watch these animals doing things that we wouldn't be able to normally see if we were sitting there. Now, these are some hippos' heads that are just sticking out of the water. And hippos come out at night time to eat grass. And we have some hippos that are outside eating some grass. Could we go to main north camera, please, Jerry? Jerry is the director of the show, and she can change to the picture. There we go. That is main north camera. And you can see that that's what a hippo looks like. These are young hippos. They're not very old. And they are eating grass using their lips to pull the grass up. If you have a look at a cow, the next time you can see a cow in the neighborhood where you live or possibly on a farm close by, you'll notice that they use their tongue and their teeth to pick grass. Hippos use their lips. Now what I want you to do is make your lips into a hard line. So everybody just make your lip into a hard line, a hard flat line. Makes you look very silly, doesn't it? Now imagine being able to pick something using your hard lips. 
on the ground. Try and pick up your pencil or your pen on your desk using your lips. That is how a hippo picks up grass. Simeon, you want, to, you want to know where in Africa we're filming from. Simeon, we're in Kenya, which is up on the equator, halfway up Africa, on the eastern side of Africa. In, in other words, if you're looking at an African map, on the right-hand side of the map, about halfway up, you'll find a, a, a relatively block-shaped country called Kenya. If you put your finger in the middle of Kenya and you pull your finger to the bottom left-hand corner, that is where we are. We're on the Mara River, right close to Lake Victoria and Tanzania. We're just in the bottom left-hand corner of Kenya. And that is where we're busy watching these hippo. This is the Mara River. This fast flowing stream and we're looking at hippos on the banks of the Mara River right now. Now, Ransom, you wanted to know why hippos are so dangerous, and the answer to that question lies in this picture. Hippos are dangerous for two reasons, mainly because of people trying to feed themselves. People in Africa grow their foods on the banks of rivers because it's easy to get water to their crops. Rivers also carry very nutritious sediment, sand, to feed their vegetable gardens. And people get fish from rivers and water from rivers. And basically, that means that people and crocodile or and hippos are in constant contact with one another. And hippos are dangerous. But something else that's dangerous is a crocodile. And we've got some crocodiles eating something at cul-de-sac crossing. So let's go there quickly and go and see a crocodile feeding frenzy at cul-de-sac crossing. There we go. That is a group of gigantic crocodiles, a couple of hundred, maybe even a couple of thousand pound animals that are busy eating something in the river. Those flashes of white that you can see are the crocodile's teeth. What's happening over here? Yeah, these crocodiles are fighting for food. Can you see that? So something has died or they've caught something in the river and now all these crocodiles are coming to eat it together. And if we're very, very lucky, we might even get to see crocodiles spinning. There we go. It's crocodiles spinning. They can't chew their food. They have to rip pieces of the food off by spinning. And they are spinning at the moment in circles. But then, there we go. Oh, there's some huge big meat going in there. Wow. It is something big that these crocodiles are eating. I don't know what it is yet. It's difficult to see. Let's see if they make another spin. Might be a wildebeest, might be a zebra. I can see, oh, there's another crocodile spinning. There we go. Isn't that just amazing? So very similar to sharks in that aspect, is they can't chew off pieces of meat, and so they spin off pieces of meat. I still can't see what they've managed to catch. All right. What we're going to be doing is sending you three and a half thousand miles south to South Africa, where my friend Tristan is sitting with a beautiful cat. Well, we are indeed in a very warm welcome to Jessamine County Public Library in Santa Rita Elementary to sunny South Africa, which is now not so sunny because our sun has just set. And we have the most elusive of the big cats sitting behind us. Now, my name is Tristan as... as Steph said, because I have Sebastian on camera with me. <laughs> Getting all tongue-tied with all this S's this afternoon. But we have this young male leopard who's sitting here and he's very, very sleepy. And that's because he's got a belly full of food. So he's managed to kill an impala yesterday morning. And he's been feeding on that for two days. And then this morning, another female leopard came into this area, which is unusual to see two leopards together. And she managed to make another kill. And this male has now got both the kills up in the tree. So that's the tree that the kills are in. There's the one kill over there, which is an impala that he's managed to grab and he's eaten all of it really. There's only a little bit of meat left. And then the other kill is right up at the top of the tree. And that is called a steenbok. And it's a small little antelope that we get in this particular area. So he's going to have a lot of food for the next day or two. There's the steenbok. You can see a bit of the fluff and fur 
that is draped over the tree. And now the leopards do that because of hyenas. There are actually hyenas around. There was one hyena that was here, and the hyenas will try and steal the food from the leopards. So he has to be clever and put his food in the tree so as the hyenas don't get to it. And you can see, look, he's put his head up now. He's starting to yawn, which is good news for us because hopefully it means he's going to wake up and he's going to go up into the tree and start feeding. Look, he's looking up into the tree. He's looking at the carcasses. He's maybe going to start looking to go up because it's now starting to get a lot cooler. We had a very warm day today, and so it's now getting cooler and it's time to feed. George, you want to know how I spot the difference between a cheetah and a leopard? Well, George, the easiest way for that is for me to show you the difference. So I'm going to try and get my book out, and we're going to be able to then show the differences between these two beautiful cats. I've got to just try and find them in the book quickly, so you're going to have to bear with me for a little bit, George. And give me two seconds, because the cheetah are somewhere in front here. Alright, so let's go with the leopard first because that's what we can see. So if we have a look here in our book, there is the leopard. Now the leopard is a very, very short animal in comparison to the cheetah. The cheetah is much taller and you'll find that the leopard is very stocky, so it's very powerful and it's got lots of muscles and strength in its shoulders. You'll also see that it's got these little white markings underneath the eyes. So you see that there, those are very, very white. Okay, and then the spots of a leopard are different to that of a cheetah. The spots of a leopard, I'm gonna try and see if I can get a better photo of the actual leopard's coat because it's much better. All right, here is probably better, Seb. But the leopard spots, you see, they almost look like the spots have exploded. So there's a little gap between the spots and there's little gaps in between them. And so these are actually called rosettes and not spots. The cheetah will have proper spots and will not look like this. So I'm gonna try and find a cheetah for you quickly. Where, there we go, there's wild dogs, so it must be very close. All right, so there is, oh, my page is all stuck together because of some rain that we had a while ago. But there we go, there's our cheetah. And we can see now a little bit more clearly that the cheetah, you see it's got solid spots. It doesn't have rosettes like the leopard has. And then look here, you see it's got a big black line that is running from its eye down to its mouth. That almost looks like tears that are coming down. So the cheetah has those that is different from the leopard. And you also see that the cheetah has a very small round head, whereas the leopard is a lot more powerful and it's got a big, thick set shoulders and a powerful head. And the cheetah is a very slender, long, thin animal. If we look at some of the pictures down below, you can see that it is very tall. Look how long its legs are and very thin. So it's built for speed and not for power. If we think of the leopards, the leopards are more powerful animals and they are built to be able to climb trees and go into places, whereas the cheetah is more speed. And I know that the cheetah are a lot more up in the Mara than what we see here. Here in South Africa is a great place for our leopards. So there we go. Hopefully that helps you a little bit more and you'll be able to then recognize the difference between the two. Kate, you want to know how long they'll feed off one kill. Well, Kate, it depends on the size of the kill. So in this case, these kills are both quite small. So this leopard probably will be, I would say, another maybe two days that he'll be killed. I'm just moving so we can try and get you a better view of our leopard. Our leopard. How's that, Seb? Is that a bit better or a bit more forward? Okay, so we're going to just go forward a little bit. There we go. So I would say probably another two days because he's now got a new kill. If he hasn't had that new kill that he got this morning from that female, you would have found that he would have finished that older one in the la in probably this evening and would have been gone by tomorrow morning. But it depends on the size. A, a, a big antelope like an impala sometimes will take them two, three days to kill, uh, to eat, whereas something small like the steenbok, which is the other animal in the tree, that will normally only take them about a day. It also depends on how they've fed. You can see he's got a big fat tummy, so he's not going to be able to fit much in there. Whereas if he was very skinny and he hadn't eaten for a few days, then he would be able to wolf down all of this food in the night and then leave this area in the following day. So it just depends on how they've been feeding and also how much food they've actually caught. But he'll still be here for quite some time and I'm sure the female that killed that other small steenbok, she's actually not far from us. We saw her this afternoon and she was about, I would say, 100 meters from where we are now. So she might show up at any minute now as well and we'll get not only one but two leopards, which is super rare and will be very exciting if we do get that second leopard coming towards the tree. I was hoping though that this time of the day that he was going to go up and actually climb into the tree and start feeding because it's amazing to watch how much power they have when they try 
try and climb and when they use those big powerful front legs and they grip their claws into the tree and they scramble their way up as they go towards the food it really is impressive and if he does jump into the tree we're going to find the hyenas are going to come running here so I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen but it looks as though he has had a really long day and that he's going to sleep more than he's going to be active. Sunny, are you wondering if the cheetahs and the leopards live together? Well, Sunny, the cheetahs and leopards do live in the same parts of Africa. So you will find that there is leopard and cheetah in this particular part of South Africa and the same in the Masai Mara. But they occupy slightly different ecosystems. And so what we mean when we say ecosystems is that you'll find the leopard will often move around in dense thick vegetation. So where there's lots of trees, lots of long grass and where there's these big steep drainage lines. Now drainage lines are areas where water moves, so like a riverbed, and leopards love that because they ambush predators. They're very, very powerful, but they're a little bit slow, and so they need to be able to get in close to an animal and then surprise it by jumping out. So that's where they like, whereas cheetah, because they're very fast, they like to have very open areas where they can see a long way and there's nothing that's going to hurt them when they're running. So not too many trees, not too many bushes, and they're able to then use those areas. So even in a place like this, we'll find leopards that will be in, in the thickets and the cheetahs will try and be in the big open grasslands like what you see in the Masai Mara. So they do occur in the same general area but they will have slightly different places or ecosystems that they like to spend more time in. It's not to say that you won't find a leopard and a cheetah together. I have seen leopard and cheetah in the same sighting before and it's very dangerous for a cheetah because a leopard is a lot stronger than what a cheetah is. Now we're going to sit with our leopard for a little bit longer, see if he wakes up. If he doesn't, there is also some lions that are not too far away that I want to go and see what they're up to. And so we'll spend a little bit longer with him. And while we do that and watch him snoozing away, let's go across to my friend Taylor and her lions in the Mara. Hello again, everyone. We're still sitting with our lions. Now they've crossed the drainage line which is really, really good news for us. You can see one lioness and the little ones have actually joined her. I thought they were told to stay behind on the other side of the drainage for safety because if they do go over and chase uh, the buffalo and there were also huge herds of zebra that have just joined us too, they're still quite far away. Those little cubs will be in danger. They could actually get killed. So that's why mom will hide them away and say, right, you sit here until I've caught you dinner and then I will call you to come through and eat but these cubs are naughty they don't really want to listen to their mothers now Lauren you're wondering how much do lions weigh well it depends so the females are much smaller than the males the females only get to about I'd say about 150 kilos for a female but a big male can weigh uh, anywhere between 180 and I would say about 210 kilograms so they're not small animals but what's more impressive Lauren is not how much the lion weighs but how much the the animals that the lions are hunting weigh for example a buffalo can I mean if you've ever seen a picture of a buffalo before it's difficult to show you in the dark because they've moved off over the horizon but a big buffalo bull can weigh about 800 kilograms that is huge and the lions can take that down quite easily. <laughs> How do we record the animals without us hearing them? Well, Ethan, can you believe it? These animals are actually used to us, not us as people, but in the cars. So they become habituated to the vehicles. They're not bothered by it at all. And now we're using our special infrared light, which is a light that the lions can't really see. dark is a little bit of light still and just on the horizon in the west where the sun is just set I can't see lines from where I'm sitting I have to use the little monitor that I've got below me to actually see what Jar is filming but that's cool so even though there's a reflection on their eyes there isn't a lot of we don't have that that's been put away how cool is this? Oh, they're all coming back. So it doesn't look like they're going to hunt just to make for it to get completely dark. Now we're going to go to Tristan, and I don't know what he's managed to find, but he has had a lot of luck with leopards. 
We have had lots of luck with leopards, Taylor. It's been a leopard-filled afternoon. So earlier today, I managed to see a, another two different female leopards as well as this male. So we've had leopards everywhere today and it's been really quite something and very special afternoon. But our male leopard is still very sleepy and this is not a fully grown male leopard. So even though he looks big and bulky and like he's got a big head, he's actually not the biggest male out here. He's still a young male and he's going to get bigger as he goes. Now you might hear a vehicle coming behind me. That's because we have lots of people that are coming to see these animals from all over the world and they are coming to have a look at the leopard. Now, Lever, you want to know what age do leopards begin to hunt? Well, Levi, sometimes leopards will already start hunting small things like insects and mice and rodents at the age of four or five months old. So sometimes very early in their life. Most of the time, though, we'll find them starting to really hunt and concentrate on hunting when they reach about eight months to a year. That's when they're going to start chasing birds and mice and, and really trying to hunt. They'll only really start catching big animals like this when they're over a year old. So impalas and, and varying other antelope species or, or, or things like deer that we have out here in South Africa and that's when they'll start is really only after a year old. This particular male is a very interesting one because he unfortunately his mom disappeared when he was still very young, much younger than what he should have been on his own and so he had to learn how to hunt very quickly and he's done so so well because he's learned and he's been able to feed himself even without his mom from a young age so he's done incredibly good job and he's growing to become a really pretty beautiful leopard now he's got his head up so i wonder if maybe he's going to start waking up for us i hope that he is you might notice that we're in black and white and that's because we're in infrared it's starting to get dark here in south africa and that means that we don't have much light to work with and the camera then battles to be able to see what's going on so we put on the infrared so that we can see these cats without having to turn lights on and disturb their eyesight Kelly, you want to know if leopards eat anything they catch or do they only eat certain animals? Well, Kelly, a leopard has got the biggest, biggest variety of food. So they like lots of different things and they'll eat pretty much anything. So they eat anything from insects like termites all the way up to baby elephants, baby giraffe, baby hippos, baby rhinos, those really big animals and everything in between. So they really will eat anything that's made of meat. You'll very seldom hear of a leopard eating anything else. They sometimes do actually eat grass, but that's to clean out their system and to get their stomach into good health. So it's not because they're hungry for grass, but they'll eat meat only, but they do sometimes chew on grass every now and then. But they do have a very varied, varied diet and, and like I say, they eat a lot of different things. But here in this particular part of the world and where we are, most of our leopards will target small to medium sized antelope. That's what they're going to be going after and that means things like the impala and the steenbok. But did you see he's yawning? Now yawning is a good sign that he might stand up. He's getting oxygen into the lungs and he's going to try and get the lactic acid that's built up from him sleeping all day to move around the body. So we might get lucky and he might stand up. I'm hoping that he will and that he'll go into the tree. No, he's just looking around at this stage. But if he yawns again then maybe we'll have a better indication if he's going to stand up. It's a good thing to look for when you see a cat yawning if it's been sleeping for a long time it often means that they are going to start moving. No, he's just looking around. He's still very aware of what's around him just making sure that there's no other signs of threats because when he's got food like this things like hyenas and lions and other leopards are going to be attracted to the smell and those are all going to be dangerous oh look at that yawn did you see how big his teeth are he's got those massive canines that he has and those are going to be what he uses to be able to hunt and, and to kill animals and then the rest of his teeth are a little bit different shape they're more triangular which is what he'll use to actually eat the meat of the impala or the steenbok yawn. Simeon, you want to know if animals have ever tried to scare me away or scare me off? Yes, Simeon, I've had elephants, rhino, hippo, um, buffalo, lion and leopard all charge me and try and snarl and growl and trumpet and 
vocalize and chase me away. So I've had all of them at some point and, and they sometimes it's because they're protecting their baby, sometimes they're injured and, and you come across them and you don't know that they're injured or sometimes they're having a bad day, particularly with the elephants. They can sometimes be a little bit grumpy and they've had a bad day and then they just decide that you're going to irritate them and then they get a little bit cross and they chase you away. So you do see it from time to time from them and I have been chased by them. But the best thing with that is when you just see an animal that's not happy and it's it's giving you some warning sign so maybe it charges towards you or it trumpets at you or it growls at you is to give them space and to move away from that animal and not to stress it out in any way and then what will happen is that animal once you moved away it will realize okay this is not a threat to me and over time it will get used to your presence and then it's going to be comfortable with you being closer like we are with this leopard and we won't have to stress the animal and the animal won't be stressed by us and we won't be stressed by the animal being aggressive to us so it's all about just being respectful to the animals much like we need to be respectful to people it's the same with animals we need to be able to give them the space that they need and if they show that they're not happy then they we move out the way so you see he's standing up i told you he'll move if he yawns a lot and there we go he's now going to start slinking off into the darkness that is the night so he's not going up towards the tree which means we'll probably end up leaving him in this area and, and letting him slink off down into the drainage and try to see if we can go and catch up with those lions that are not lying too far away from us. Olivia, you want to know if this leopard has found a mate. Olivia, no, not yet because he's too young. So this leopard is only now, he's just under two, well, he's about just over a year and a half old. So he's not very old at all. Male leopards will only find a mate generally when they're four or five years old. Sometimes a little bit earlier, but most of the time four or five years old is when a leopard finds a mate. Whereas this guy is still a little bit too young so he's going to have to wait for a bit he has to grow up he has to get bigger he's still a little small to be trying to mate with the females so it's going to be a while now look he's coming to the tree i wonder is he going to go up the tree for us i hope he's going to go up the tree it looks like he's going towards it there we go you see he's looking You'll see how quickly he'll go up. It's amazing to watch when the cats jump into these trees. They are so athletic and the leopard has so much power. It will be very quick. Yeah, I think he's going to go. Look, there we go. Up he goes and into the tree. How cool is that? So it's always one thing to see a leopard. Oh, and up he goes to the carcass. So there is where the kill is. And that's what he's going to try and now start feeding on. Isn't this cool? <laughs> Reese, you want to know how long the food will last him in the tree? Do you see how he's easily able to move in the trees? This is what makes leopards so special. He's unlike the other cats that really struggle in the trees and can't climb very well. Leopards are completely at home and look at how he's able to move around. It really is amazing. Now Reese, the tree the carcass will last probably I mean, this carcass has lasted now just over 36 hours that he's had it. So it will probably last the night. And by tomorrow morning, most of that will be gone. But then he's got another carcass. And that's why they put it in the tree. Because it's going to last longer. Because he doesn't have to worry about fighting hyenas up in the tree. And look, he's now sitting right at the carcass, getting comfy so that he can start eating. Or just to protect it and lie on his carcass. Because when you have a food, sometimes you have to sleep on it if you're a leopard. To make sure everybody knows that it's yours. So he's actually sleeping on the meat at the moment which is not going to be very nice because he's going to be a bit stinky later but I suppose he's just showing everybody that this is a carcass look he's watching I think maybe a hyena is coming this way because there was a hyena behind us and he's looking behind me so maybe the hyena is coming said can you see a hyena behind us yes there's the hyena behind us you know, the hyena is going to come now now so hopefully we will see it A young hyena that we've got behind us so that's why was the leopard in the tree is watching so carefully but the problem is is it's right behind where Sebastian is so there you can see the hyena behind the car so I apologize about the antenna because unfortunately that's how we send our signal to all of you but there we go there's our hyena so you see look look at how it's built it's very different to the leopard you see it's got a angled back not straight back like the leopard it does have spots the same way but it has a very powerful head and that angled back is because hyenas are scavengers a lot and when they do hunt they try and chase animals for long periods of time they don't have a short burst of speed like the leopard does and so that's why they have a very different back structure to what 
the leopard does. Wow, well, we're going to sit here and just enjoy our beautiful leopard sitting on top of his carcass and we're probably then going to try and see if we can go and find those lions with the big male for all of you and while we do that let's go across to Taylor who's still sitting with her lions and hopefully her lions are going to decide to get up and move around and maybe head towards those buffalo in the distance where she is let me reposition quickly i think what i'm going to do i'm not going to turn my lights on i'm going to stay in the complete darkness we'll find that lioness now what i want to do is i want to put get a better view of i'm gonna to have to use my spotlight just to shine a little bit i'm not shining on the lions i don't want to put my big brights on what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn us so that we're behind the lions and that we'll be able to see the zebras just behind them. I'm also going to scan for this lioness. Now a question from David, you're wondering if the lionesses would reprimand the cubs? Um, most certainly. Uh, I'm going to just duck quickly. Now, often, yeah, the lions are just to the left of us. You can just see that's just a roof that we have on. Sorry, David, I'm going to get to your question now. You can see the eyes as well every now and then from the zebra. We've parked on a horrible angle. I do apologize. We're just straightening out the camera. Uh, they will, and it might not be a reprimanding that y you and I would know when you would discipline a child. Uh, it often ends up in growling, sometimes even swatting at the youngsters, or even just exposing their teeth. And and I think I think they got too excited. These little ones. They were left in the drainage line, but they've also been sleeping for most of the day. So they've got all this pent up energy. And you know what young children are like. They bounce off the walls when you try to put them to bed and that's exactly what happens here they don't want to do what's told now sit down in the grass little ones because a zebra are going to spot you now it's not over just yet for these lionesses they could still use the wind and of course the rumbling of the thunder and the pitch black of the night to move around in a better position for uh, an opportunity to hunt the zebra are just out of view they're just sort of at the edge of where the light ends they're not very far i'm going to put my spotlight on again i want to have a look there are so many of them i'm also scanning for that other lioness because i wonder if she hasn't gone around hmm where on earth did you go like i said there were two adult lionesses here so i don't know where she's disappeared can you see her? No, I can't see her. I don't know where she's gone. She completely disappeared in this long grass. We can scan and scan and scan, but I think she's actually moved off completely. Uh, I've spoken about the various hunting techniques of lions before, and it's one that we see the lions doing uh, quite a bit of in South Africa. Obviously, like I said we're in Kenya now, uh, in the Mara Triangle, and one line, if it's a big pride of lions, will normally go around and try and chase the prey towards another lion sitting in the grass just waiting. That Maybe that's going to happen, but that'll be a little bit dangerous tonight, especially with those cubs now being out in the open and completely exposed. That would not be a very good idea. The hooves of a zebra, of a buffalo, could quite easily trample those cubs to death, and that would be really, really sad. We would not want that to happen, but it, that's what nature is about, of course. It's not always good news for the little ones. Sometimes the prey end up winning, and I've been seeing a lot of that recently. Now, Jack, you're wondering how long will the cubs stay with their parents? Jack, it actually depends on the sex of the lion. So if it is a female lion, she'll probably stay within the pride for the rest of her life. However, in this area, we do see a lot of lions breaking away from, from main prides and forming sort of little sub-prides. Uh, if you're a boy, if you're a male lion, then typically you, when you get to the ages of about two two and a half years old that big resident males are going to not tolerate you like they did when you were younger and then the process of being pushed out starts so anywhere from about two to three years old uh, they'll start going off and searching well it's actually it's very tough life for young males once they leave uh, their pride um, they aren't big enough and strong enough to take on the other males in the area 
so they sort of have to live in between the territories of the big of the big males and they become nomadic it's a very tough life for them a lot of males don't make it to adulthood Now, Karen, you're wondering if the scent, not if the wind, keeps the scent away from uh, the zebra. Uh, uh, typically, yes, it would, and that all depends if they're downwind of the zebra. The wind is swirling quite a bit. When we first found this pride this afternoon, the wind was actually coming uh, from a completely different direction. It was sort of more coming from, uh, the, I suppose, the southwest, blowing up towards the zebra and buffalo. We didn't have zebra early. It was just a huge herd of buffalo. And now it's changed. Now it's swirling below, below. We're just at the base of the escarpment. So every now and then they're, they have the wind in their favor, but then every other sort of minute it changes. And I think their scent is blowing towards the zebra. And I wonder if that's what startled those zebra. Now, Kate, you're wondering how far can a lion see in the dark? It's a difficult one to answer. I've never looked through a lion's eyes before, but their eyesight is exceptionally good, and it, and it really is spectacular at, at night. You can imagine a zebra, a wildebeest, a uh, buffalo can't really see very well at night. They have better eyesight during the day, but the predators come alive at night. So the way that their eyes are designed, um, it allows them to take in light, and that's why you see that sort of white stripe underneath the lion's eye that help reflects light back in to their eyes so that they can utilize it and actually see a little bit better so I, I'm not exactly sure in distance how far away they'd be able to see but definitely much further than you and I well I can't see anything at the moment it's complete darkness Now, Carla, you're wondering how old are females before they become a mom? Well, I, I would say that a lioness will come into estrus for the first time, maybe around between two and a half and three and a half years old. But just like you and I are completely different, the same thing applies to animals out here. Some might mature a little bit quicker than others. Some might take a little bit longer. And they might not even breed in their, within their first estrus cycle. But she's up again. She's scanning around. Look how tall the grass is. So it's actually going, should be quite easy for her tonight to hunt because she's got so many things on her side. She's got the wind. We'll just quickly recap in case there are any new viewers who have just joined us. So she's got the wind. She's got the darkness. There's clouds. And yesterday was full moon. So she's lucky about that because if the moon was out, oh, they would have, the zebra and the wildebeest and the buffalo would have spotted her from miles away. And, and then she's got the rumbling of the thunder. And then, of course, this tall grass is fantastic. Look how they completely disappear in it. Just see their ears. Now, a common misconception and that a lot of people will sort of hear, and they hear that lions and most of the predators only hunt at night. And Leia, you're wondering exactly that. Lions are opportunistic feeders, so they will hunt whenever they want to hunt. Sometimes a warthog may stumble across a pride of sleeping lions in the long grass, or the same thing might happen with a wildebeest or a zebra. They're not going to say no to it. They will most certainly charge after it, so they take any opportunities that they can get. But it looks like everything has calmed down for the moment, but I suspect we'll sit here for just a little bit longer and see if things develop. I am going to say goodbye to all of you who are watching this live broadcast, but um, keep a look out for that notification because you never know what might happen next so from all of us here at wild earth we'll hopefully see you in a little bit Well, as you can see, we've left our leopards and, well, leopard, should I say, up in the tree sleeping. And not more than, I would say, 300 meters away is a whole pride of lions. So you can see there is females and a very big male that is with them at the moment. And this is a pride that we see the most here in this part of the Sabi Sands. It's called the Inkuhuma Pride. And there's five adult females and six cubs that are about just over a year old now. And then there is this big male lion that is with me right next to the vehicle over here. Now he's part of four brothers or coalition members, should we call it? They're not all related and are not all brothers. They are in the, say, from the same pride, but they are not brothers per se. They're not from the same mom. And this particular male, he is called Mfumo. And so 
he spends a lot of time with this particular pride and I believe they had a wildebeest kill last night that they ate and they finished that and so now they're just resting and sleeping away the day and into the evening but look at the size of his paw you see that that paw is probably bigger than my hand and it'll probably be about the size of my face it's massive it really really is and that will be able to do a lot of damage so he's got a very big paw Noel, you want to know what lions like to eat? Well, Noel, it depends where you are in the world. But here in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve in the northeastern corner of South Africa, our lions love buffalo. They want nothing else but buffalo. They will catch wildebeest and zebra and impalas and giraffe from time to time. But what they really want is buffalo. They really like buffalo and they enjoy eating buffalo and hunting buffalo and that's what they look for mostly. In the Maasai Mara where Taylor is with her lions, those lions will like to hunt wildebeest a lot more because there's a lot more wildebeest than there are buffalo. They will go after buffalo but they will prefer to hunt zebra and wildebeest because there's a lot more of those animals. Then if you go into other parts of the world, so if you go into the Kalahari Desert, there the lions will hunt an animal called a chemspok which is a very large antelope or an elant which is one of our largest an antelope and an elant will weigh close to 2,000 pounds so that's what they'll go after in the desert areas but here in this part of the world buffalo is the number one choice for our lions they love a bit of beef that's what they want when they go after food Layla, you, you want to know if they only hunt at night? Layla, no, they don't only hunt at night. All cats, lion, leopard, cheetah are opportunistic. So what that means is that they'll hunt at any time of the day. So they will, might hunt in the morning, the afternoon, in the middle of the day. But at night is better because at night, look at how well they blend in. If I move my light away, you can see those on the edge of the light, how they just very difficult to see. But the lion's eyesight at night is very good. They're able to see incredibly well and they ha then it becomes easier for them to hunt so they like hunting at night because it's easier than hunting in the day but they will hunt in the day as well I was hoping that if we were with this pride at this time of the day though talking about night is that we might hear them roaring because they like to roar at night time to establish their territory and tell everybody that this is my area and my place particularly the male Every you want to know how many lions are in this pride? Well, every there's five females, six cubs, and this big male that's not always with them. So this male will come and go quite a bit. He'll sometimes be in this area, sometimes he won't be. But the pride itself is five females and six cubs. The six cubs are five females and one male. So there's one male that's got a tough time. He's got five sisters and five mothers basically to sort, well, one mother and four aunts to sort him out. So he's going to have a tough time of it, but he has some company from dad every now and then. But they are all very fast asleep. The one female is looking around, but otherwise it's a little bit comatose. And unfortunately, that's really all we've got time for this afternoon. It's been an absolutely incredible afternoon. We've had lions and leopards and cheetah and hyenas, and it's all really been quite chaotic and unfortunately our mail has just passed some wind and it's very stinky so <laughs> Seb is just saying wow it's very stinky but we really have been spoiled this afternoon and I hope all of you have enjoyed it and that you've learned something with us and we hope to see you all again soon on Safari Live and for our rest of our viewers we'll see you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari <laughs>